Coming to you from high atop our studios in the San Francisco Bay Area, you're listening to Tech Move. This is episode 37. In today's episode, this will be our NAB 2017 annual show. Here's some awesome interviews with reps from Panasonic, Manfrotto, and OWC. Plus, a very special guest appearance from DP extraordinaire, the one and only Philip Bloom. I'm Rod Louie, and with me is Keith Moreau. Get ready. It's time for another exciting episode of Tech Move. Let's go! A very special episode of Tech Move with Rod Louie and Keith Moreau. This is our annual NAB review slash show. Yes. Um, Keith, NAB happened in Las Vegas uh, around April 22nd to about the 27th, I believe. Uh, and you were probably there like somewhere around the 24th for all the exhibitors and all that kind of good stuff. I am certainly pleased that Tech Move is yet again represented in the media there at NAB. Uh, incredible. I'm sure you were able to buck the lines immediately. I'm sure yes. you were able to, uh, you know, cut in front of all the little kids with their cotton candy. Uh, because we all know that those kids are just dying to get into NAB. But... Um, Nonetheless, uh, I don't think I saw any children. Actually. Right. Well, yeah. that's right because <laughs> because you took their tickets, so they <laughs> they don't have any. But Keith, tell me uh, a, a little bit about uh, uh, what you thought, kind of overall of the show. What was it? What I know in our last discussion, we were kind of thinking that maybe not a whole heck of a lot was going to be going on during this NAB. T tell me, I was wrong. Tell me I was wrong on that. No, you weren't wrong. <laughs> you were right. <laughs> Nothing happened, right? Nothing. It was It was basically like, it could have been last year's show. <laughs> Here's a three-pronged electrical <laughs> outlet. <laughs> um, you know, the, for, for me, anyway, for, for our, our interests here, it, yes. wasn't, it wasn't ground. It wasn't earth-shattering. Yes. Um, but because of lucky events and just kind of happen to run into certain people and, and, and get a lot of information unexpectedly, you know, I didn't, I didn't go in having a lot of expectations because I think that, you know, it seems like when there's announcements, they happen a little bit before the show. And this year there was just nothing. Yeah. There, there were no new announcements. I was like firmware update, you know, or, or something pretty minor. Um, there was there was the mystery camera from Panasonic, but that wasn't even you know the the only thing that was cool about that was you got to see supposedly see it under the veil. Um, <laughs> Did they ever take off the veil? No, they didn't. But they're going to take it off in Cinegear. So ah, we'll, okay. We'll d definitely do a, um, an exclusive at Cinegear about this this new weird camera they're having. Great. But um, yeah. So so it could have been really boring, but it actually was I think for me the best one yet. Oh really? The best yeah. one yet? Wow, the best one yet. Good. Just I think because I felt more comfortable doing it. Um, I didn't feel like I felt like I just could just barge into any conversation and 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 manipulate uh, and 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 monopolize people as much as I want without any repercussions. Um, <laughs> right. Well, I, felt, I, I mean that press credential for uh, Tech Move d does speak volumes year after year after it, year. So it does, and that little wallet photo of you I have <laughs> when that doesn't Thank work, you. right? You know, those two things are just like <laughs> keys to the city. That's right, exactly. You know, keys to Las Vegas. That's right. So exactly. Yeah. So it, it, I guess it could have been kind of boring because from a, from an announcement point of view. It, it, you know, there, w there wasn't anything, but for me, 
and I think for the listeners because of that, it it was it was, it's it's one of the most fun ones yet. I th- you know I, I I would expect that I I think that you know these shows are always fun you know even though there's you know l- like there's no huge anticipated thing like you know like the GH five is being announced or anything you, you, you know it's uh it's still good just to see what happens after the fact. Yeah, it is. And then, and then maybe, maybe because there aren't these amazing wow announcements, Mm. you can focus on more real stuff, you know, like looking at stuff that has more practical use or has, you know, refinements that have been to something that has been around for a while. Right. Um, So anyway, yeah, I, for me it was great. And uh, it was a good experience being there with Veronica again was great you know we had a good time together she's a great production assistant and uh she she aims that ipad with a lot of skill yes and and much thanks to her for uh (laughs) capturing the uh the moments that we need for content of our show so i uh, much thanks goes to her hey she's actually i just have to say she's really good at at traffic control too oh good because yeah because what happens is you know we need a kind of a certain amount of space between uh the, the iPad camera and and, and me. And right. It's not exactly the widest lens in the whole wide world. It actually isn't. I should probably get a, a little, but it's actually okay. Cause, cause it, it would be a little distorted if it, if it was too wide. Right. But, um, but she's really good at traffic control because you wouldn't believe how many people try to just walk through the shot. Oh yeah. You know, oh, and they're I, just oblivious. I know. I know. Yeah. And, and she's, and a couple of times I think she actually hit people in the face as they were trying to get through. So good. You know, whether just quick arm movements. That's very good. It's called, yeah. Tech move, tech move foo. I think it's called. <laughs> good. So good. <laughs> uh, you, you know, uh, here's one thing that I've never, uh, asked about, uh, any of these shows is that, you know, just like other conferences and stuff like that. No, not only is, you know, the things that you and I are, are, are kind of, uh, uh, excited about which is like Mm -hmm. the exhibition floor and and seeing all the gear touching it in person and stuff like that but also a lot of these shows spend a lot of time with doing panel discussion do you ever attend any of that stuff or you are you not interested in that so much um i think i've done it a little bit uh, the very first one i went to a few years ago but um it i just don't have time i'm just so busy just trying to kind of just maneuver around the show and get some interviews going. And I guess if I was there for like four or five days straight and just all I was there was at the show. But this year I only had two days. Um, last year, kind of the same. I, I, I planned to spend three days there this year, but and which would have given me time to go to those panels and things. But um, I just, uh, the last day was was booked by another client who happened to be in Las Vegas, actually at the time, at this other convention in another convention center. So... I just sacrificed one of the NABs for for this other client. So, um, yeah, I think I think if I had it in like three or four days, then I would definitely take advantage of that. But no, it's just too busy. That's fine. I yeah. mean, uh, uh, you, you know, sometimes you know when I attend certain conferences, you know, some of those panel discussions are pretty much the same things all the time. You know, and and a lot of them they televise uh, later, or I mean, they they YouTube later. Sure. You know, for example, Cinema 5D, you know, they have a really great blog website thing. Mm-hmm. They're kind of amazing. Kind of wonder how they stay afloat because they have, it seems like they have a whole army of people working for them and, and, uh, you know, they have lots of content all the time. Uh, they had a, I watched their panel, um, about, I think it was about how to, how to support their, how they support their, their blog. Mm-hmm. And it, that was kind of interesting. And and how they do their reviews because they've actually had some really controversial reviews, especially in the last couple of years, mm-hmm. like like about like like uh, refuting manufacturers' claims of 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 how great great their stuff is and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> right. you know how did you interpret this level of dynamic range and we we just measured it you know thirteen stops and you said it was fifteen stops right. stuff like that <laughs> you know <laughs> stuff so so um yeah they're. So I saw that on all the stuff is basically on YouTube, you know, right. and I, I subscribe to all the stuff. And when I'm exercising, I watch it. So I don't, I don't need to, I guess I don't need to, I don't have the need to see all that stuff in person when I'm there. I'd rather do this stuff for tech move and get the interviews in. Well, you know, Keith, uh, I approve of that. 
and uh, <laughs> and and I'm I, I thank you very much for for putting the uh, the efforts of the show first, as it always should be. So very good. <laughs> that's a very good, that's a correct answer on your oh, part. Oh, good. So. Yeah. Good. Very good. Job well, security. Right. For me. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Uh, you know. There were, uh, you know, as usual, tons of vendors there, right? Tons of vendors. Um, and I know, you know, in in our pre-show meetings, uh, I know that we have, you know, we're visiting a couple of people that, that we've talked to before, at least companies. Maybe the people are different, but companies we visited before. But you know what? It's always exciting to go back to some of these innovative folks and, uh, and to come back with, you know, what's new for you know, in this instance, 2017, right? Yeah. That, that, that's always a lot of fun. Wouldn't you agree? It is. And some, some, some of them I didn't see last year, like, like I saw them the first year, but didn't see them last year and then saw them again this year. Yeah. And it was kind of, it was kind of cool. It's, it's, it's maybe, sometimes it's good to skip a year. Like I did that with, uh, with Panasonic, I did that with, uh, small HD. Um, I think those are the two main ones that I skipped last year. Last year, right. But yeah. as you'll find out, this year we did uh, secure some fantastic content for you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> those those we, were both fun. Yeah, w- 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 with those two. So, yeah, that, that that's good. And, 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 you know, now is the time, right, especially with the GH5 and it being so huge and massive in popularity and things like that. That's yeah, that was thing. probably the most, I, for, from our point of view, the most major camera announcement that was close to NAB. Right. Because I think I'd I'd gotten the camera like a couple of weeks before that. So, or maybe a, it maybe a month before, but it was pretty it was pretty soon before NAB. So, that was probably the freshest NAB experience. Yeah. And then and then there was the kind of kind of newish but not so new Ursa Mini Pro. Um but I wasn't honestly wasn't so excited about that that particular camera because it had been out for months and been tested and I kind of knew all about it already. Sure. So, and then also, and, and we'll probably talk about this when we intro that segment. It's, you know, there's different, different, different companies have different levels of how they represent their products. So we could talk about that later. So that sounds fantastic. <laughs> well, good. That's what we call tease, ladies and gentlemen. That's what we call tease in the broadcasting world. Fantastic. Well, um, Keith, what do you say? Let's uh, l- l- let's start off this special edition of Tech Move, uh, and get to uh, get to our interviews, mm-hmm. and uh, and then at the uh, you know whether or not we get to each and every one of them on this particular episode because I don't think people have uh, six to nine hours to listen to one <laughs> podcast, uh, even though they're used to our two to three hour ones. You know, I think sometimes we should just have a six hour podcast. Just <laughs> just to break whatever record there is. That would be fantastic. I don't I don't know what the record I we maybe we've already broken it with our three hour ones, but right. uh if six hours, I mean how many how many podcasts could claim six hours? Exactly. Who 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 could <laughs> and then really who would? So uh <laughs> All right. Well let's uh let's pause and let's reset and get our uh, interviews all lined up uh, like nice little ducks in a row. And uh, we will start laying them out there for you, okay? okay. So uh, it's Rod Louie, Keith Moreau on our NAB 2017 special. And we're going to get right to it as soon as we come right back right here on Tech Mode. Reporting on the NAB 2017, it is Rod Louie and Keith Moreau uh, here on Tech Move, and we have another special uh, guest, uh, which I am very excited about, uh, only because I am still wrestling between uh, two different formats here of uh, Sony and Panasonic, <laughs> right? I mean, like, uh, what, the uh, Sony's come out like... Uh, the A6300 came out about a year ago. The uh, the A6500 now came out about f- uh, five months ago, six months ago. 
and I've still yet to make a decision on anything. So um, with having said that, maybe our next interview will persuade me on something else. And uh, Keith, you were uh, fortunate enough, and I know you did this really for me rather than, <laughs> than anyone else, and that is uh, to secure a uh, some time with the good folks over at Panasonic and specifically talking about the GH5. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have uh, a, a man of great importance that you got a chance to talk with. His name is Matt Frazier. Yes, and uh, you you conducted a, a, a pretty extensive uh, interview with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me how this came about. Um, yeah, so we went to the Panasonic booth, which I'm not sure if it's just because it's so popular or because it's just really badly laid out. But um, the Panasonic booth is just pandemonium. Every time I've been there, it's just been utterly crazy. Well, that's like, because every time they they're introducing like new stuff, right? It's always like the GH four, the GH five, or you know whatever G series they've got going on. I don't know. I I think it has to do more with traffic uh, control and <laughs> traffic engineering than than the popularity of the product. But I'm maybe maybe not, that may or may not be true. It just seems like there's like really narrow areas to 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 see the experts, and then everything's kind of mixed together, and you have to go from. I don't know. It just it the booth, like the other booths. I don't experience that. I I feel like they're more spacious and they have like a little more a little more uh, elbow room. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know, or maybe just because Panasonic is just super popular. But mm-hmm. in any case, we went to uh, this one area where the mystery Panasonic camcorder was 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 kind of covered up, which we talk a little bit about in the interview. Yes. Um, and then I asked the guy, so can we talk about the GH5? And he said, oh. T- T- talk to that guy over there, you know, across the way. Um, th- that's that's the uh, the uh, digital uh, photo camera section. So we w- we went over there. Oh, so they had so they they certainly had different zones. Almost it sounds like, huh? Yeah, yeah. The Lumix uh, the Lumix stuff is considered still cameras, and then then they have and, you know Panasonic has tons of super high end very cams and things like that, and that's in the other section. So I think this the the mystery cam the mystery camcorder was in the kind of cinema, the very cam section. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Lumixes are in another section. Um, and and I actually got to meet this guy that I've seen a lot on the internet. I interviewed him a couple of years ago in NEB and talked about the GH4 back then. Uh, well, we got a chance to talk with him about the GH4, and I really like him a lot. He's really cool. Mm-hmm. So we had a great interview. We even talked for quite a while even afterwards about stuff. Because um, for some reason I thought he was uh, like a like a filmmaker, like a DP. Uh, I don't know why, but I had that impression that he was. Um, but I think he's just he works for Panasonic now. That's what he told me. But um, uh, we just kind of talked about you know filmmaking and stuff like that. And he was just saying, well, you know, I'm really admiring you because you're actually you're actually doing this and you're making a living on it, at it. And you know, <laughs> and so that was kind of cool. Um, but he was a great. Uh, source of information and learned a lot about the the GH5 from him. Probably could have talked for another hour about all the stuff. Great, so, great. Well, yeah. hey, let's get to it. Uh, here is uh, our own Keith Moreau uh, with Matt Frazier of Panasonic as we talk about the GH5 and all that comes with it. Here it is, right here on Tech. Mode. Hi, this is Keith Monroe here with Tech Move Podcast. We're here with Matt Frazier. He's a representative from Panasonic. He's going to talk today about the wonderful new camera, the GH5. Hi, Matt. Hi, how you doing? I'm very good. Tell us a little bit, a bit about this uh, amazing new camera. I actually bought one. I think I was one of the first people to actually receive one. I got it about a month ago, and I've used it a bit. So. Hopefully you know that we just did a firmware update today, so you can go ahead and download new firmware for the camera. Tell me about it. Okay, so we've added... Uh, Kind of an interesting omission. Um, we had omitted a 10-bit 1080 feature. So you could do 10-bit 4K, but you couldn't do 10-bit 1080. So that's been added now. So you'll be able to get 10-bit 1080 422 color. Um, we also didn't include a 10-bit anamorphic feature. Oh, so we've added 10-bit anamorphic. And then the third thing we did, there was an interesting quirk with the camera. Um, for those of you out there who shoot with shutter angle, um, shutter angle on the camera they weren't showing you a preview of what the exposure was. So you'd hit record and it get darker. So we fixed that. Any other quirks we should look out for? 
even in this firmware update? Um, really, those are the primary quirks that we know of. Um, other than that, it's just learning the camera and the new menu system and making sure that you're familiar with how it operates. So I've used this. I probably shot about, I don't know, 10 hours of footage on it, not, not a lot. Um, I love the fact that you can internally record uh, 4 to 2, 10 bit in uh, 4K. That, I just love that. Yeah, I think it's great. I think that's an awesome feature. I think an even better feature for me personally is the five axis in body stabilization. So we're actually moving the sensor up and down, left and right. We have roll, we have pitch and yaw adjustment. And for me, it's sort of liberating because I don't always have to put it on a gimbal and balance it out to get that steady footage now. So if I just want to shoot something quick, or if I want to operate more incognito, it's great just to have a camera that looks like an SLR that I'm getting this amazingly steady footage with. That's awesome. So one of the things, and this is maybe a little bit controversial, so maybe you don't want to talk about it, but one of the things that I've been reading a lot about, I haven't personally experienced it too much because I haven't used the autofocus features on it, but one of the things that I've heard is that the autofocus is kind of hard to use, and maybe in some situations it doesn't work that well, in other situations it works great. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I, th I think if someone's a GH4 user and they're replacing it with a GH5, the autofocus is substantially better, no matter how you have it set up, than the GH4, which was our ultimate goal, was to make a better autofocus system than the GH4. Um, there are some people who are comparing it to, let's not beat around the bush, it's the A6500, A6, A6300, and any dual pixel Canon. It's not that system. And so I think people need to understand a couple of limitations. Um, First off, if you're planning on doing autofocus in 24p, our sensor readout when you set the camera to 24p is 24 frames per second. That's what its sensor readout is. I don't have a lot of frames to be able to analyze to autofocus at 24 frame. Some other companies who do autofocus quickly at 24, I assume they're probably processing 60 frames every second and then extracting 24 which explains the visual difference they probably see between our 24, which is very cinematic, and some other 24 systems that have a tendency to maybe look a little bit more like a video 24 frame. So the point is, we're not willing to sacrifice our 24p aesthetic to get faster autofocus. So first lesson, don't set the camera to 24p if you need fast autofocus. The 30 frame and 60 frame should work beautifully for autofocus. So that's the first lesson. Second lesson, Use 60 or 30 frame if you need to rely on the autofocus system. Um, and then when it comes to the settings, you know, our company is recommending using single point for the autofocus system. I personally get great results with the 255 point autofocus that's built into the camera and just allowing the vectoring algorithm to do its job, which is to track the subject. Um, the customizations really have more to do with what you're trying to get the camera to do. So if you don't want it to be constantly hunting while it's locked on something, which all the autofocus systems have a tendency to want to hunt once it's locked on something because it's seeing minor movement changes or minor changes in the image. That's where the sensitivity comes in. You can dial it all the way down to locked on. And what you're literally doing is you're telling the camera, unless something gets in my way for a long time, I don't want you to change the focus point. I want you to stay where you were. So it's really just to tell it not to do that all the time. And then the speed is really just about making sure that it's not too fast to focus as you're transitioning, because that can sometimes look jarring or abrupt. I, I, that may sound complicated to some folks, but the fact is if you just leave it in the standard setting and at 255 autofocus, I, get, I guarantee it's way better than your GH4 ever was, and it will do a great job of tracking. So um, some people are saying use the one point autofocus rather than the 255, but you say that a 255 works for you? I get good results from 255 because I like to have it track my subject and that gives me a greater area of tracking and a more aggressive um, use of our vectoring. Um, our engineers, they're recommending one point autofocus because they feel like for what people are trying to accomplish with it, which is a lot of the complaints are for vloggers who are turning the camera on themselves, the one point is probably going to be a little bit better for that. I think it's marginal the difference. I pr I trust the two 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 twenty or sorry two fifty five for almost everything. So um, so I'm gonna uh, ask you a question. I, I don't expect you to answer it, but we've been looking at the uh, the camera over there with a the little cloth over it, 
and it's cover. It looks a little bit like a AF100, whatever that camera was back in the past. So tell me about it. Well, well the, nice, the nice thing is I can honestly tell you, and I'm not lying to you right now, I know nothing about that camera because I work on the Lumix division side, which is the consumer group, and that's from a completely different group. So I get the, I get the luxury of being able to honestly tell people I have no idea what that camera is. It's got a really nice cloth veil to it. Yeah, like covered in cheesecloth, muslin cloth, right? You can kind of, I mean, you can kind of see what it looks like. You just don't know what's in there. It looks very interesting. I have no doubt it's going to be something exciting. They won't tell me anything, and I've asked five people in the booth. Did they just take, kind of like take the covering of this off and chip off the plastic and stuff it into that case? I have no idea. I've literally not seen under the cloth. When they brought it onto the floor, it was in under the cloth when they brought it onto the floor. Yeah, so it, nobody here knows except for a small group of people. <laughs> I'm not one of those people. And thank God I'm not. I really don't want to know what it is at this point. So um, Matt, getting back to the GH5. Um, so I, I like to shoot 24P, but um, I also do a lot of documentary and things where I do want to see how the autofocus works. Um, so one of the things that it, now, and comparing to the Sonys again, one thing I like about the Sonys is they have that, while you're recording, you can punch in the magnification, and I don't think the GH5 has that. Is that true? No, it can't do it. Um, the, the reality is, is the way that we are writing the information to the memory card, again, I don't have 100% confirmation from my engineers on this, so this is my hypothesis. Um, our punch-in would end up recording onto the image. So it's just the workflow within the camera and where that punch in happens versus where the image is written. Um, we just can't get around that right now with the way we write things. Okay, so my number one request would be figure out some way to divert the path of that from writing to just at least enlarge it on the, on the viewfinder. If we can do it, I'm sure we will, but that's an if we can, and I don't think we can. Okay, anyway, getting back to the 24P autofocus thing. So suppose I recorded in 60P, which you, you works better for autofocus. Um, and then later in my post, converted it to 24. What, how do you think that would work? Well, it'll have a little more of a video look, but the, the truth is is that, and this is gonna get very, this is gonna create a flame war, I can already tell the minute I say it. Um, Not, nobody listens to our, our podcast, so no, it won't matter. But here's, here's my stance. If something is moving really fast in 24 frame, and it needs to be tracked for autofocus, it is going to be a blurry nightmare as it's moving at 24 frames per second. You're shooting at a 48th of a second shutter speed. Movements in 24 are supposed to be slow, deliberate movement. And if you use slow, deliberate movement that doesn't introduce judder into the moving subject, the autofocus system will track that. If you're trying to induce a stuttered, blurred look in your 24p footage, it's not going to track that. So I think you can use the autofocus system for 24p as long as you use good technique for making sure that your subject isn't blurring as they're moving. That, does that make sense as I'm explaining that? Yes, I do. Okay. I, do under, I do understand. Um, you basically can't do like uh, whip pans. It doesn't really matter because it won't be in focus anyway. But at the end of that, you'd like that limb to be in focus. Right, and it will acquire it's just gonna be long to acquire. And so if you're using camera movements that don't introduce a lot of heavy blur, you're moving at the speed that the camera can autofocus for it. So that's, the, that's my guidance. You don't have to like it. I'm, I'm not saying it's what you want, but that's the best way to use it. Okay, that's awesome. Anything else you wanna tell us about the camera before we sign off? Well, I mean, it's got a lot more than just autofocus in it. I mean. Um, the camera can do 180 frames per second for slow-mo. The camera can do 60 frame 4K, so you got a slow-mo for 4K. Um, it uses the entire sensor size now, the width and, and height. So it's a wide, wide angle lenses are wider. It, um, the anamorphic mode on it is fantastic. So if you have people that want to use anamorphic optics, you know, anything short of an Arri Alexa XT is frankly more compromised for anamorphic. Um, there is no better anamorphic solution for this other than the Arri Alexa XT, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think those are all fantastic features that we've added to the camera. And then one final couple of things, we have tools, like real tools for people to be able to use. Like um, if you look in the camera's menu, and you guys can clearly see the menu right now on this ultra-wide lens, um, we have 
waveform monitors built right into the camera now. So if I'm lighting my if I'm lighting my scene, I can now read my information correctly and get it properly lit. If I want to white balance, it's no longer a guessing game. I've got a vector scope now, so I can white balance and black balance the camera at this point. So there's a lot of tools built into this camera right now. And then in the future, you're going to get a 400 megabit all intercodec for 4K up to 30 frames per second. So your editing should become just that much easier once we offer that firmware update. Um, are there going to be any other bit rates besides uh, 400 megabits? No, that'll probably be the last bit rate change. Um, we will add a 6K or high resolution anamorphic mode. So the anamorphic mode now is 3328 wide by 2496 tall, which is still one of the highest resolution out there. The new mode will be about 4997 wide. So that's 997 pixels wider than 4K. And it'll be about 3,600 tall. Don't quote me on that. It's, it's, I don't know the exact pixel densities. So you're going to have really arguably the highest resolution anamorphic mode on the, on the market, with the exception of the reds that use that 8K sensor. I personally think spec-wise and feature-wise, it's just an amazing camera for $2,000. It's just incredible. I'm really, really glad that Panasonic, and you probably helped out with this, uh, came out with this amazing piece of technology. It's just going to jump the industry ahead another, another three years. Well, I didn't help with anything. It's important to know. It's the people who use the camera who tell us what they want. It's our ability to interpret what you want and determine if it's feasible. And it's ultimately our engineers and their skill that makes this happen. So it's really the people who use the camera and our engineers who make it work. I'm not really any part of it whatsoever. So it's you guys who help us out. Well, thanks so much, Matt. It's really been great talking with you. Really appreciate your time. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. This is Keith Morrow signing off for TechMove. Well, that's Matt Frazier from Panasonic, of course, about the GH5, along with uh, Keith Moreau. And our continuing coverage of Tech Moves NAB 2017 episode that we've got here. And uh, Keith, uh, one thing that I got uh, from it, w which I uh, very much appreciate Matt for saying, is how, you know, it is such human nature for us to compare like a GH5 to an A7 or mm -hmm. uh, or Canons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and him saying, you know, hey, those those are just not, uh, you know, GH5 is just not those cameras. Yeah. And, and, and we should really be looking at it from the standpoint of, you know, Rod Louis GH1 to now, <laughs> right? Or, or even the GH4 to the GH5. Yes. Cuz cuz you know uh, of course you're competing against, you know, other manufacturers, but in many ways you're competing against yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought that was uh that was very interesting and you mm -hmm. know, hey, let, let let's face it, GH5 incredible uh strides have been made with that camera versus GH4. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's definitely definitely better than the GH4. I yeah. mean, I've I've shot a couple things with both of them in the same environment, and yeah, the the GH5's image is way smoother. Um, its light sensitivity is way better. Um, it's it, the fact the internal codec is way better. I mean, it's just a lot better. Right. It's so, a lot better. So, so you know, anyone thinking of you know maybe picking up a GH4 versus a GH5 probably should really just save up their pennies and just, you know, get the GH5 because it's going to be so much better. Yeah, I think so, especially if you're doing video. Yeah. You know, it's really an amazing hybrid video camera. It's just the features in it. Um, so I, I love the GH5 uh, just in general. I don't think I'm going to use it for my A-cams. It will not be your A-camera. I don't think it's going to be my A cam. You, you you've had you've had time to work with it now, yeah. right? I mean, since since even this interview with Matt, where yeah. uh, at the time I think you had done about oh what ten hours of shooting at that particular time. Now now you've yeah. had a little bit of a, a little bit more of a uh, process with it, correct? A little bit more of a process. I still need to to take it exclusively on like a run and gun type thing and not use other cameras. But um, I had this one shoot where I had it was like a six or seven camera shoot. Um, all these cameras set up at once. All I had my I had three Sony's. I had the FS5 and the two A7S, uh, two and the A7R2, and I had two GH4s and I had this GH5. 
So they're all kind of filming the same scene, mm. different angles, and but the lighting's similar. Could work with the GH5 in post really well. Um, it had I was using a native lens on it, really sharp, easy to blow up or change, kind of shift around um, image quality. Um, and it, it looked pretty good. There's just something, and it, maybe it's a tuning uh, process, but there's there's just something about the um, image that's a little bit flatter um, than, than the A7 s- series. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it maybe it's just the sensor size and just the quality of the sensor. Um, it's way smoother than the GH4s, though. It's it's it doesn't the GH fours have this kind of blockiness, kind of a grittiness. It's a lot less gritty mm-hmm. than those, so mm-hmm. that part's really cool. Um, there's just uh, something about it. It's not quite as filmic as the A sevens, and it could be that the GH five. I just need to tune it better because I haven't spent a lot of time at it. The main thing that I'm un- regretfully uh, on it is that it uh, the auto the auto focus is okay uh, when you set it right, and that part's fine. But the fact that you can't check focus while it's recording, and I even talked to Matt about that in mm-hmm. in the interview, mm-hmm. is is kind of um, it's a huge it's a huge thing that's not there, and that's that is present in the A7s, and that means when you're actually when you're actually recording, you know, not not before you're recording, before you hit record, but when you're actually recording, you can't zoom in at that point and check focus. You have mm-hmm. to rely on peaking, or maybe an external monitor. To, to see if you're really in focus. And that's that's an option. But if you're just doing run and gun, maybe you don't, you know, you have it up to your eye. You don't really, it's, it's you don't really have an external monitor. You have just the camera. Right. And and with the A7s, you can actually zoom in. You can double it and kind of fine tune the focusing. And when you're doing shallow depth of field stuff, um, or even, you know, th- even not as shallow with the GH5, you still can be a little bit out of focus. Mm-hmm. Um, and then to rely on the autofocus in the GH5, which is good, um, but still maybe not as good as like the A7R2, uh, then how are you going to make sure things are in focus? Mm-hmm. Um, because peaking, it, it, I haven't found that peaking works really well in any of these cameras, uh, for focus aids. I find that you, you, you almost better just looking at the viewfinder than using peaking just because mm-hmm. you don't know if you're going to be in focus with peaking. And really external monitors are probably the best. For if you have the time, like if you're in a semi-stationary situation, um, yeah, definitely use an external monitor. That's what I use all the time when I'm not moving around. But sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're looking through the the uh, the eye the eye uh, viewfinder, mm-hmm. and that is where that zoom in, you know, little button, assignable button near your your finger. Yep, is is a great tool on the A7s. I use it all the time, um, and I don't want to have to stop recording. Uh, focus and then come uh, zoom in and then come back. I want to be able to do it on the fly. Right. So so that's that's I wish 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 that they had added that, or they could somehow and technically and I even begged Matt for them to add it. And he says I'm not sure if it's possible, but we're we're looking into it. Sure. So well, anyway. Well, the neat thing also, and I and I think this is actually uh, uh, something that you care about is was that firmware update that uh, occurred at at the time of. Uh, of the show, yeah. That what what uh, ten bit in uh, uh, at ten eighty p something like that. Yeah, um, Does, I pers I personally, I mean, I, I I I I'm glad that they did that. I personally don't care about that because I would never, never ever ever shoot that camera ten eighty p. Oh, you would not. No. Nah. Why okay. why bother? It's a four K camera. Right. Use it to its fullest. Okay. You know, get that four K so you can do whatever you want with the image and then if you want to do 1080p just do that in your post you know and it'll look a lot sharper anyway than a 1080 native Mm -hmm. image so um but what i am um really looking forward to is that 400 megabit per second codec that's coming out in a few months that that, that's probably towards the end of summer if i'm uh, correct on that yeah i think so i think so and that that'll be which will be a charge also i believe um I'm not sure about that. I think it's just an update, but I could be wrong. Okay. All yeah. Right. Well, hopefully yeah. it is. Hopefully yeah. Hopefully it is. But as far as a camera goes, I'm still really glad I got it. I'm going to use it, you know, as a as a B C camera for multicam shoots, and know that that image that I'm getting out of it, it's going to be really cool. Uh, pretty good battery life, and um, excellent codec. 
and I'm just happy that Panasonic is pushing the boundaries. And uh, also big feature, I think no 30 minute limit. That's a huge feature. Is that um, correct? No it's a huge feature limit? for built. Yeah, and I wish Sony would and other manufacturers would would get rid of that limit. But <clears throat> since I hacked my Sony's, I I don't care about that limit on them. <laughs> oh, you hacked your Sony's? Yeah, a while back, um, there's a way of removing the 30 minute limit. Oh, well, yeah, we'll have think... to share that again on uh, <laughs> uh, 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 on another how to uh, episode of Tech Move. Yeah, and I've and I've literally shot with these Sony's for like five hours straight Oh, on 256 gig, uh, gigabyte cards. And they haven't set themselves on fire. No, they weren't. Um, I did have to, you know, call the fire department a couple times during yeah. the shoot, but right. they Wrap it, it in fossil, foil. False alarm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Great. All right. Well, hey, uh, that's good stuff. Um, okay. Matt Frazier from Panasonic. Thank you very much, Keith. You're welcome. Another uh, tremendous uh, get for us. And uh, I know all of us, as well as our listeners, are greatly appreciating your bullying your way through the uh, the crowds at uh, NAB. So, uh, continuing on with more NAB 2017 coverage, we will do so right after this quick timeout right here on Tech Move. It is Tech Move and our continuing coverage of uh, NAB 2017. Uh, Keith, you ran into some of our uh, old friends at OWC, isn't that right? Right there on the floor? Oh, yeah, I did. I actually uh, had to uh, search for them. It actually, I think it turned out to be the very, very last interview that we did the whole show. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was, we were, were, um, I think, going to leave the next day. Actually, no, I had another shoot at this Oracle conference the next day. Mm -hmm. So I had to finish up uh, that day. And... One of the things I really wanted to do, because I actually haven't done an interview at NAB with OWC, and I'm I'm I have tons of their stuff, you know. Right. And yeah, so searched them out. It was really funny because it's actually sometimes kind of hard to find these these vendors. You know, they have like a list of of, of the number, like the aisle and row, correct, that, that they're in. But right. it's it's kind of confusing about like where to find them. Um, because it, it, it's almost like, it's not like addresses on a street. It's kind of skips around sometimes. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. and, 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 and then they list down what the, you know, other vendor next to them is, but if you don't know who they are, then it, it really doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess there's some technology like a map or something like that, but I couldn't get the normal high tech stuff that, that I had previous years, like the, the NAB app wasn't working or maybe I forgot my password or something hmm. stupid like that to it. But, um, Anyway, I, I, I was going down in the aisle and I asked this lady, so do you know where this number is? Because it was close to her, her, her number. Mm-hmm. She was in some small booth kind of like alone and nobody wanted to she, she, you know, she's view her doing, product. She's doing uh, palm reading probably, <laughs> right? Or, or, or it, you know, or refreshing it, uh, uh, the, the ink wells in, in the free pens you get. It was, I think it was some kind of technical product. But sure I don't know was. exactly what it was. Yeah, but sure. um, <laughs> so I asked her, and she said, "Oh, um, I think it's down that way." But here's a hint: Do you see these little teeny little um, stickers that are on the floor? They actually have the the number of the the booth on them. And I looked down, and these little really nondescript stickers are are there under pretty much like on the corner of every on the carpeting. Like uh, almost like they're uh, reserved parking spots, right? J- kind of, yeah. It's kind of like gaffer's tape that's yep. just been stuck down, like sure. a little gray. But it's really low contrast. So you, you can't, your eye just wouldn't see that. Um, and it, but it was like the kind of like the most useful hint I ever got at NAB. <laughs> so um, I'll be using that. For Besides, the where's the restrooms? <laughs> but that's that's good. Yeah. So with that hint, I found the OWC booth, which. It was really amazing that I missed it because it's gigantic and there's a huge banner that, and you can see from across the whole hall. So <laughs> I don't know how I missed it. Well, well you, you know, in your defense, I, I'm looking at, at at a screenshot of the of the clip uh, that we're gonna run, and uh, the the it, it doesn't say OWC. It says something like the capacity to dream. <laughs> so how would you know, right? Well, I mean, actually. But not in that clip is a gigantic kind of like flying saucer <laughs> disc that's like 50 feet across that it says, it says OWC, OWC <laughs> in big blue letters 
like three times around the circumference. So the only thing. thing they were missing were fireworks <laughs> and a uh, and a Goodyear blimp. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah, and a Barker saying, "Come over here, we're OWC." Step well, right up. Well, that's the observation <laughs> skills of Keith Moreau. Uh, that that's uh, it's just a stim- it's just stimulus overload. There's too many banners and signs and sure, you know, I was I was blind to that particular one at the time, <laughs> but I did find them and uh, I managed to find a really really cool guy named Chris Hafner, and he uh, he was a gem. He took a little while to um, to talk to me because he was with some other customer who did not want to let him go. And I just kind of kept hanging around. And finally, I just had to interrupt this guy. And I said, would you be able to do uh, an interview right now? And he said, oh, g- give me a minute. And the other guy, his his other customer, who I guess thought he was really important, kind of glared at me like, how dare you interrupt me? But, <laughs> right. hey, we're the press, you know? That's right. got to get the news. So <laughs> That's anyway. right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. Well, let's... Um... Let's kind of get to the uh, to the interview here. Uh, I'm excited to hear about this because okay. uh, OWC old friends of the show, mm-hmm. and uh, we'd like to. Uh, and and I think this is great. Out of like the what the f- the two dozen NABs you've ever gone to, we finally got someone from OWC, which is great. So <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, let's give it a listen. Here is uh, Chris Hafner along with our very own Keith Moreau as uh, we bring you NAB 2017 right here on Tech Move. Hi, this is Keith Moreau from Tech Move Podcast here at NAB 2017. We've got Chris Hafner here of OWC. Um, I have about $300,000 worth of OWC products over the years, and actually OWC has been a sponsor of Tech Move in the past. Um, so I actually did a little pre-interview with Chris, and we talked about what I wanted to talk about and so first, Chris is going to give us an overview of just OWC in general, some of the Thunderbolt stuff, and then he's going to do a deep dive into some of the enterprise stuff, which is something I'm interested in. So how's it going, Chris? Good, good. So starting with Thunderbolt, <laughs> as you mentioned, um, some of the coolest items are the most simplest ones, uh, like our Thunderbolt uh, and USB 3 drive dock. A uh, lot of interest in this. I mean, countless people are keep coming up and telling me, like, this, is the, this saved my butt so many times. This is the best thing ever. Um, and it's it's so simple. I mean, there, there's there's two bays for two and a half inch or three and a half inch hard drives, um, separately powered, uh, and the power supply is built in. And you have the option of going Thunderbolt two or USB three on that. Um, we also have a USB three only version of that. Same awesome features of being able to power it on and off at each drive independently. Um, just a straight USB for somebody who doesn't need Thunderbolt. So. Um, what type of speeds can we think? Do you think these can uh, throughput? You're talking about what drive you're using. Uh, that that's really what what is going to determine the speed on that. Because Thunderbolt, there's so much bandwidth in Thunderbolt. Uh, it really comes down to what drive you have on there. So uh, that'll vary. So, so for example, this this SSD here, uh, the Extreme Pro uh, 6G Mercury Extreme Pro 6G SSD. Uh, you're going to be up in the the 400s, 500s even. Um, it can be pretty fast. Uh, yeah, that we have benchmarks on, on our website. You can check out any of our SSDs uh, to see you know, what individual ones have benchmarked at because it, it does de- depend on the type of data that you're using too. Um, I don't want to get too techy, but like- No, that's okay. Incompressible data rates are different than compressible data rates. Um, so what, do, what does that mean? So things like media files, uh, a lot of those be considered incompressible data. They can't really be compressed anymore um, when they're on the storage. So. Uh, those would have a different data rate than than uh, just normal like document files would be, because uh, those can be kind of compressed on the fly and and, and when they're stored in the flash modules on there. So, um, yeah, different SSDs will get different data rates with different types of data, um, which just goes to show there there's there's a lot of options out there and there there's a lot of um, needs in, for different types of SSDs. It's not just like oh you need an SSD. No, you need a certain kind of SSD for what you're doing. Um, and obviously our SSDs, we, we have a very big focus on making sure they're you know qualified for you know different types of cameras and, and different types of uh, uh, media systems. So I'm talking a lot about that, so we can stop there. No, that's okay, that's great, that's great. See, the thing about TechMove, it gets really geeky. So we don't mind, in fact, we have a segment called Put Me in a Coma. So we could, your segment could be part of that if you want. Um, but actually, let's, let's uh, 
anything else you want to talk about regarding the, some of the new products? Well, the, the Helios PCI Express expansion chassis that have, you know, basically takes Thunderbolt to uh, PCI e-cards. Um, so you can put in like an eSATA card, uh, some of our, you know, uh, Excelsior E2s. Uh, so really it's about expanding the, the functionality of your Thunderbolt equipped uh, Mac or PC. Um, so this, so for example, I could have a MacBook Pro with Thunderbolt and then I could plug a Thunderbolt cable into this and then I could put, could I put a graphics card in there or something like that? We won't do graphics cards. Graphics cards are a whole can of worms that we, we don't, probably don't want to get into today, but we did announce um, that we're working on uh, an ex external GPU box, um, Thunderbolt 3, uh, d doing some support for graphics cards uh, externally, which has been a really requested feature. So, Okay, so for example, you could put uh, maybe an eSATA card into here. Yeah, or a 10 gig Ethernet card, um, you know, eSATA, mini SAS, USB cards. You could put as, as long as the driver supports uh, the Thunderbolt, you're good. So, great. Well, that's a good segue because you mentioned mini SAS, yes. and so we're going to maybe transition because I know that mini SAS, SAS, you can give us all the definitions, but it stands for serial. No, no, you can tell me what it stands for. <laughs> uh, SAS, S A S, stands for serial attached SCSI. Okay, and I remember SCSI back from the old days, like 30 years ago, when it was like these big things that looked like parallel printer cables. In fact, I actually worked for, for a huge uh, hard drive company back in the day called Jasmine Technologies, which was like in the mid-80s. And they were like the first hard, external hard drive companies for the Mac. And they lasted like five years, and then they, they were super big, and then they just disappeared. But um, so I remember um, at one point I was actually in their repair department or their tech support department. And we had like 3,000 of these SCSI cables st st stacked up because um, they were always go ba going bad. But, but so, so it has something to do with SCSI? Everybody hears SCSI and, and certain, some people kind of hear SCSI and they think it's like a bad word. Because <laughs> uh, they remember the complexity of like the old school SCSI, right? But, um, but it's just a protocol, right? Yeah. So, so with, with SAS, you kind of think of it more as like the, the bigger brother to SATA. Um, in what way is it, is it the bigger brother? So there's, there's multi-channel capabilities in it. Um, it's kind of just more enter. So, this is me kind of summarizing it, but it's kind of like um, the more enterprise version of, of SATA. Uh, where SAT is kind of focused in on consumer level. Um, SAS is definitely geared more towards an enterprise level. Um, so accommodating, you know, like HBA failover capabilities in, in a larger you know, storage system. Oh, but of course, HBA failover capability is, is so important to me. <laughs> yeah. What does that mean, actually? So uh, think about a system where there could be two controllers in there. Um, and if one controller goes bad, they're connected to the same drives. But if one controller goes bad, the other one can take over. But both kind of need to still communicate with the drives, even though one may be doing the sole access to it or, or controlling it. Um, they're both kind of communicating to do um, a failover if necessary. So, got you. So if one card is it goes bad, the other card knows what's going on, so it can just take over right away. Yep, that's that. That's one of the features in there. Um, another more obvious feature is the. The serial attached SCSI can actually go up to 12 gigabit per second, um, where SATA is at six gigabit per second. So. Okay, so a single connection can actually, uh, it has a tw tw uh, twice the bandwidth. Uh, yes, yeah. And I mean, hard drive, spinning hard drives like these, really, even if it was SAS 12 gig per second, it's not gonna spin that fast to actually give you that, those data rates. So really more about solid state uh, SSD type storage. Or perhaps if you have an enclosure that has, is rated and has a faster throughput because you're combining all these drives. It's still going to be limited by on each drive. It can only go so fast. So the data coming off that drive is going to be uh, one of the limiting factors in a situation like that. So, so okay. So here's my situation. I, I'm doing a lot of 4K video now. And, and in a lot of cases, I have to transcode it to ProRes. So it's, it's even further enlarged or expanded from the original format. So the original formats are kind of compressed on the cameras. They're like uh, H.264 possibly. But in order for my computer to deal with it, a lot of times I have to transcode it. So then you're starting to get into these huge files with high bit rates. So what, what's your, 
if I'm doing, say, a multicam shoot, so with, like I just did something with six 4K cameras, and I'm editing it with Premiere Pro, and it's just even ProRes, and I'm doing using a couple different eSATA drives, it's still chunk, chunk, chunk. It's just very, very slow. So what's, what's your best recommendation for this? Um, I, would, I would probably look at going, you know, a Thunderbolt equipped storage system of some sort, um, like our, we don't have them around here, it's at the next table over, um, but our Thunder Bay 4 Mini uh, would be awesome to put in uh, for SSDs, uh, and, and it's th Thunderbolt 2, so you, you have speed, and, um, and the you, because it's solid state, you wouldn't have you know latency issues uh, that could really help out, uh, you know, in addition to the sustained transfer rates that you would be getting uh, from those SSDs going through the Thunderbolt. Um, that'd be an excellent option, yeah. What would be the th throughput in that situation? Um, you're pretty much going to max out the Thunderbolts back. So <laughs> I don't have hard benchmarks on, on that right now, but we can definitely look at that. So. Now, because of the fact that I'm still using uh, a Mac that was produced, that was designed and produced seven years ago, and I've totally maxed it out. I don't know if you know like all the things you can do to these things, but I have upgraded the processors. I've actually taken the processors out and put the newest fastest processors in, which was a nightmare, but I did it. And uh, and then I've also put uh, super fast video cards, lots of memory, have the, all the PCI cards uh, slots filled up. So for me, cause I can't really use Thunderbolt for me right now, maybe in the future and when the new Macs come out or whatever. But for now, what do you suggest for me? Well, uh, we had this discussion before <laughs> uh, where you have a, several different internal PCI Express SSDs in there, like the Excel Series 2. Yes, and I actually have the, the, the optical bays. I have those both connected to uh, one terabyte SSDs, and I have those rated. So I'm getting, I'm, I'm maxing out this, because I think the internals are not the fastest uh, eSATA or SATAs. So I'm maxing out at about five, five 600 megabytes per second on that. So we, we recently came out with the Excelsior Pro Q card, which is a four blade PCIe SSD card. Um, so it'll be faster than the E2 because there's more more there. What does four blade mean? So there's four individual SSD uh, blade stick SSDs. Like receptacles for the SSDs? Um, actual SSDs kind of think about, we also kind of refer to them as gum stick style SSDs because they're in that, that slim. Uh, they look like gum stick. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's four of those uh, on that, that card. And they're kind of interleaved memory so they're faster. Um, so. The setup is a RAID 0, um, but you can, we can set it up in different ways, uh, you know, if, if you choose to order it that way, which we can do a kind of a custom configuration on a need to basis, though oh, no, I, we, I probably shouldn't publicize that. So I wouldn't um, want it to be any slower. I want it to be super fast, and it's probably still pretty safe, even at RAID 0. Yeah, I, I mean, you're over a gigabyte per second, so it's, it's fast. Um, again, I, I don't have the hard benchmarks with me. I should know that off the top of my head. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. I'm, sh I'm sure it's going to be super fast. Yeah, I'm probably going to get one of those when it comes out. Yeah, up to, up to two terabytes on those right now. Mm -hmm. So four, 500? Uh, yes. Oh, okay. That could be a little expensive, but not too bad. Not, not too bad, actually. You'd be surprised. So. Okay, so beyond that, how about external solutions for me? Uh, well, I mentioned the Thunder Bays, so if we're talking direct attached storage, the Thunder Bays are, are, are awesome. But I need Thunderbolt. I don't have Thunderbolt. Yes, yeah. So for you with, the, with your Tower Mac Pro, um, it's still a great machine. I mean, those machines had a lot of legs to them. They still do have a lot of legs to them. Um, I, I personally handle a lot of the storage server side of our, our you know, product development, so I have to give my little plug in for, for Jupyter. Uh, our Jupyter Callisto systems are... Uh, a network attached storage system. So it's standalone storage server uh, using ZFS inside. So it's uh, for the file system. So in a nutshell, what that means is uh, you have built-in pooling, built-in caching, uh, built-in integrity checking and self-healing. So it even fix, detects and fix silent corruption, bit rot, things that can occur that like a hardware-based platform wouldn't even be able to detect. Uh, so really good, storage place for your data. Um, fast, uh, the Callisto systems have 10, 10 G base T ports on them. So it's 10 gigabit ethernet using CAT 6A, CAT 7 cabling, even CAT 6 cabling at, at reduced cable length. Um, so think about your Thunderbolt 1, Thunderbolt 2 speeds. That's what you're getting over ethernet on these from this, this shared storage system. 
Um, we can do SMB network shares on there, AFP network shares. Uh, it's really customizable uh, as far as how you choose to configure it and how you structure your storage on it. it. It's a fun system. So I would need to get a 10 gigabyte PCI card. Yes, yes. Um, but because it's using 10 G base T, you don't necessarily need to, if you all you need to do is run it at gigabit speeds, you can just plug it into a normal gigabit switch and, and gigabit ports. So. I think for me, I think I need more than gigabit. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. You, you'd probably want 10 gigabit Ethernet. So, and it's it's cost effective. The alternative, you know, 10 gigabit standard is using it over SFP plus ports. Um, so, think more like fiber optic cabling. Uh, they tend to just be more expensive, even if you are still doing copper using F SFP plus ports. Um, it still just tends to be more expensive. So, okay. So how about uh, any type of other than the uh, Ethernet? A type solution. How about SAS solutions? Yeah. So Jupyter Core systems are the the JBOD SAS expander systems. And what is JBOD for those people that don't know what JBOD is? This is one of those terms that has a lot of different meanings to different people. Um, just a bunch of disks or just a bunch of drives. So it's uh, all the drives just show up as themselves. So not rated together or anything. They just show up as individual drives. It's so like our 16 bay Jupyter core system. Uh, if you plug that into a mini SAS card that's installed inside your Mac Pro, um, you would see 16 drives. Uh, until if it was a RAID card, you, you RAID them together using like RAID 5 or RAID 6 or doing a software RAID with Soft RAID. Um, Soft RAID is an awesome RAID utility program. That, I actually have Soft RAID. Yeah, it, it's awesome. Um, I mean, it, it, it detects, you know, a lot of the things, you know, with with your data that could go wrong that, that a lot of things don't, a lot of hardware RAID cards wouldn't. So it's a very powerful program. Okay, so here's a scenario. I take out one of my PCI cards because currently I have them all, it's all filled up. I only have four slots. I put in a, a, SA, a SAS card, mini SAS card or SAS card. Just what type of card do you recommend? And then what on the other end, what type of enclosure? Uh, well, we have a Jupyter HBA card uh, that would work, work great. Um, you know, it's the JBOD setup and using it with soft RAID. Um, that, that'd be an excellent option. You know, there's other third-party cards like from, from Addo uh, Technologies that do an, a, you know, an awesome hardware RAID uh, and give you RAID 6 capabilities. Um, there, we, we, we have quite a few options you know, that you can use on, on that front. Um, another thing you can do with, with mini SAS as well, like if you plug in the Jupyter HBA, you can actually get a breakout cable uh, to go from mini SAS, which is basically four lanes of SAS. Uh, you can break that out into four uh, individual eSATA cables. So with you, with, with, with several eSATA cards install, inside your system, you could actually consolidate um, you know, and, and free up some extra PCI slots by using a mini SAS card and breaking that out with cables to go to individual eSATA ports. Okay, so how much is your, the eSATA card that you, I mean the... Uh a SAS card that you recommend? I believe, don't hold me to this, I believe it's about 250. Wow, that's cheap. No, that's that's not right. I'm thinking of a different one. Um, but it's less than a thousand. Four something, I believe, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, less than a thousand for sure. And, and then that has just one port? Uh, two ports, actually. Okay, so and each of those ports could have four eSATA sp uh, splits? Uh, yes, correct. So you could actually have eight eSATA ports coming off of that one card. Oh, I think I think I see this card in my future, and this is totally warranted and guaranteed by you guys. If if something goes wrong, like it doesn't work with my OWC drives, give us a call and we will help you out. Yeah, we'll we'll take care of you. And then this box, this enclosure that that I could plug the other uh, SAS cable into that would hold multiple drives and be rated with soft rate or whatever. Yeah. What does that cost? Uh, that's starting in the 3000 range. Uh, we have a lot of different size options, eight bay systems and 16 bay systems. Um, it's starting in the round $4,000 range. Now, can I populate with my own drives or are they supplied? We do have a couple configurations that are half populated, um, but we, we sell them uh, pre-configured with drives. So. And are they pretty much just enclosures with power supply and and SAS connections? Currently they are our are, are rack uh, storage systems. So they are, they are bigger, um, designed to be rack mounted uh, in, into a, a server rack. Um, but yeah, I, we, you, can, you could put it just on a tabletop if you wanted to. Uh, that 
you wouldn't necessarily want it on your working tabletop. You know, they can get a little noisy being a rack, but um, we have temperature controlled fans in there to help try to keep the noise down a little bit. Um, but yeah, they are designed to be put into a, a rack. So. Okay, so I think I was really lucky to find Chris. He, he, he had the precise solution for me, and I think I'm going to be buying some more to add to my hundreds of thousands of dollars of OWC equipment. I'm going to add a few more thousand dollars of purchases in the near future. I, I don't mean to break your bank. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we, 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 we love helping customers out, and we love helping you out. So anything we can do to help you, you know, work more efficiently, you know, we do what we can. So we love that. So Great. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is Keith Moreau signing off for Technique. All right, that's Chris Hafner from OWC, along with uh, our very own Keith Moreau right here on Tech Moves coverage of the 2017 NAB show. Uh, very interesting, Keith. I, I, I really liked it. Uh, tell us a little bit about that SAS and what you think about it, if, uh, if anything. Well, so here's the thing. So I'm still on my, um, you know, pretty much obsolete Mac Pro 2012. Uh, it's actually 2010, but the 2010 and 2012 were exactly the same, um, other than just the number of the model number. But um, and then mine's probably even more advanced than the 2012 Mac Pro. Anyway, the problem about the these Mac the cheese grater Mac Pros they're called or the tower Mac Pros is they don't have Thunderbolt. So Thunderbolt's awesome. Thunderbolt is a great technology that that has made connecting things a lot simpler. Um, uh, it's a it's basically like just a super fast um, PCI bus connection that's coming out of your computer and going into other devices and it's really really fast and it goes and it's it's simple because it's like one little cable not a huge you know cable with massive connectors on it um, the problem is I I just I can't use that on my main editing system even though it's still really powerful so one of the things that Chris suggested was a SAS solution and SAS stands for Serial Attached SCSI. And um, it's just basically an extension of the old SCSI protocol from, you know, 20, From way years back ago. when, right? Way, from way, back way, when. way, way back when. I think I even mentioned to Chris that I worked at Jasmine Technologies and they, they had SCSI drives, you know, yep. with these big gigantic parallel ports. I had one. Yeah. And uh, so that, that big gigantic parallel port was kind of squeezed down to a, a, like a four or five conductor cable uh, and turned into serial data. So I think the underlying protocol is SCSI, but the actual, the way the data is transferred is much more modern, uh, even though that technology is still probably 10 years old. But um, but anyway, uh, so he turned me on to this because, you know, this, the, the thing is, is that it's kind of like, it's kind of like Thunderbolt in a way. It's it's a lot like Thunderbolt. It's, it's um, maybe not as versatile as Thunderbolt, but it's got maybe speeds that even beat Thunderbolt. So uh, that was kind of cool because none of the other connections that I have, like eSATA, USB 3, none of those other connections that I can actually use are really, really that fast, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, they can only go, you know, maybe if you're really pushing at 400 megabytes a second, and that would be like totally optimized. I think mostly they're, they kind of top out at about 300 megabytes a second. So the SAS can actually go like 2,000 megabytes a second <laughs> oh really yeah yeah so which is you know that's that's at thunderbolt speeds uh thunder, thunderbolt two speeds i think so um anyway so this i got really hot on this because i have to somehow enhance my storage capabilities for all these projects that i'm doing because I'm, I'm having to transcode them to prores uh, and the prores takes a huge amount of uh, space and it actually requires a a faster drive because the ProRes files are a lot bigger and when you have multiple streams going it just adds up quick um, and anyway so and I just the thought of of having this versatile connection oh another thing about SAS is that you can actually get these breakout cables that will take uh, a SAS port and convert it to four eSATA ports or eSATA connectors mm. So right now I just have uh, one eSATA card in my uh, one eSATA PCI card in my Mac, and it and it's and it only has four ports. So I can max maximum I can only connect four eSATA devices to my Mac. 
Um, and right now I actually have five kind of online ESAT advices. So I'm using, uh, another port that's coming out of my, uh, it's actually my Excelsior card has an ESAT port as well. So I'm using that port plus my, my four card. So the SAS thing also seemed that vers pretty versatile, uh, because I could also use it for my ESATA devices if I needed to, besides just the SAS connection. The SAS connection was kind of secondary in a way. It was more just getting this ESATA breakout capability. I had previously looked at another booth, uh, Addo booth. Addo's a major manufacturer of cards, and they still support the Macs, even the the, the Tower on Macs like I have. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they have um, a lot of these cards. They're called HBAs. Uh, it stands for host bus adapter. It basically just means a PCI card with ports on it that you put into your Mac <laughs> or PC. Oh. Um, they also support PC stuff, of course. Um, but they still have current drivers for the Mac. They seem to support them really well. And uh, I had talked to this Addo previously, and they had said, yeah, we do this this and that. But then when I talked to Chris of OWC, who also support and sell Addo cards along with their own cards, um, he kind of... He kind of just educated me a little bit more in that, and that's in the inter interview to some degree. Well, I got kind of super obsessed with this SAS thing, read all about it, decided to order a bunch of SAS stuff from o OWC, ordered uh, one of these Addo cards that actually has four SAS ports in it, hmm. Hmm. which means potentially I could have 16 eSATA drives connected to it. Um, or I could connect, I could get what's called a SAS expander enclosure. Uh, and what's really cool about SAS, it's just like Thunderbolt, you can daisy chain it if you get this expander enclosure. So there's the ex basically what it is, is you take this kind of massive SAS port, and the port is about one inch wide by about a quarter inch thick, so it's kind of like a, a really, it's like a gigantic uh, USB connector. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. And, and you plug it in, and then on the other side, you could plug it into an expander enclosure, and you, the expander enclosures go from like four bays to all the way up to like 15 bays, I think, 25, 24 bays. Wow. There's, they go really big. This is what's used in the big data centers, actually, and it's still used today. It's still like a current standard. People aren't using Thunderbolt and, you know, like Backblaze or these places. They're, I'm sure that they're using some kind of SAS solution. Uh, the thing about SAS is that the cable the cable length is also a lot longer than ESAT or other protocols because the voltage it's just it's just made to be more professional so um you can get like cable lengths of like 36 feet or even more out of it wow so okay. yeah so potential so that was another good thing because i could put these noisy enclosures with lots of dr sas, SAS uh, enclosures with lots of SATA drives in them into like my my server closet or i could build a wing to my server closet and put it in there <laughs> <laughs> and I love your server closet. It is so it, it it's really a great one. It really is great. I, I I must I must say something personal that um uh your your server closet is so jam packed <laughs> with stuff. I'm surprised you don't have its own cooling system oh. in there. Oh, actually, uh, I didn't tell you, but I did put a cooling system in there. <laughs> you have to, because, yeah. like, everywhere else in the house is, you know, I think is heated by this server room. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's actually, I could probably, you know, sell my power back to PG&E. <laughs> right. my, my heat power back. But, um, yeah, no, actually, I put a ventilation system in it. So there's there's air that's drawn from below, which is basically my open basement space. Sure which is cool, right. and then it goes up into my uh, crawl space area. Okay. It's, so it flows from low to high, and I have this fan just continually running. It's actually really cool. It's like a super quiet um, bathroom fan. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, and, yeah. and it's, so it's really... it's kind of circulating the air and stuff like that. It just draws the air from below to above, and, and so before this, my I would open the... <laughs> I would be able, like be able to cook my chickens in this <laughs> closet, <laughs> right. you know, and all all the drives are all going. Help me! It's right. too hot. <laughs> but now it's just right. cool. It's it's nice. That's excellent. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so someday I'll put. So so what 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 happened was I ordered all the SAS stuff, the the Addo card from OWC, blah blah blah. I ordered some cables. I ordered these breakout fan fan out cables from SAS to eSATA to support my other drives. And, um, and I ordered from, and I thought I was going to get this ODBC, you know, a couple of weeks ago, this is a little bit after NAB when I ordered all this stuff. 
and because I even ordered it like rushed so I can get all this stuff going. And for some reason, OWC couldn't supply this card. They they kept being back ordered on it. Oh, okay. And 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 it was kind of annoying because I really wanted to get the solution up and going because I had this huge project I needed to edit that needed twenty terabytes of ProRes stuff online at once. Wow. And uh, so I just looked on eBay, and I found the same auto card used, but from a very reputable uh, vendor for like instead of like seven hundred dollars, it was two hundred dollars. Oh, okay. Yeah, not so, bad. Not, not bad. bad. Not, not bad. And so, and then there's like a little like 30 day return policy. So I just ordered it, got it in a couple of days, really quick shipping. I also uh, found a amazing deal on Amazon on a SAS expander box. Uh, so basically SAS expander box is kind of like a Thunderbolt enclosure, mm-hmm. you know, like you can buy it from ODBC or other places where there's like an in and an out port. Mm-hmm. So in an expander enclosure, in the case of uh, SAS, there's an in port for SAS and an out port, and you can j- daisy chain them. So if I got another expander box, I could actually plug it into the back of that. Mm-hmm. And you can theoretically chain them basically forever. Um, and and the, the SAS bus has such a fast speed that it, it you don't really lose any quality or any, any speed when you do this, uh, as long as you're not doing too many of them at once. Mm-hmm. Anyway, mm-hmm. Uh, I had all these old uh, Seagate 2 terabyte drives that I just kind of taken out of my my old boxes as i as i kind of aged over the years and i think we i think in. we have like truckloads of two terabyte <laughs> drives yeah. laying around right so i had this tr- so i had so i i got this amazing deal on amazon of this uh sans digital 12 bay sas expander and and i i didn't i didn't really know about these things at the time like what the prices were on these things uh but it was like $400 and i said oh this is kind of cool i could just order this and see if it works and you know, return it or whatever it didn't. And, and so I ordered it and I got it a couple days later. Um, well, well, in kind of in the meantime, I was looking at other SAS devices and I looked at that same one to see, to see it. And the price had jumped from like 400 to $1,300. Uh, apparently this, I don't know how or why this new, uh, SAS expander was, was so cheap, mm-hmm. but I got a really amazing deal on it. So I got it all populated. I actually used my old Mac Pro to kind of do all the population with these all these two terabyte old drives. Uh, got the SAS card, put it in there, worked perfectly. Did some tests. Um, had a few little issues, like one of the drives went, one of the Seagates would just died. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm using a program called SoftRaid, uh, so it's actually just seeing all these drives in the SAS enclosure as a bunch of individual drives. And then the soft RAID merges them all together in whatever RAID configuration I want. Mm-hmm. So I basically con- converted or, or, or configured the SAS enclosure to RAID 5. So uh, there's 11 drives that are, there's 12 drives that are all working at once. And if one of the drives goes down, I can pop in another drive. And then it'll resurrect it in, you know, like eight hours or whatever, however long it takes. So um, these drives are su- kind of slow. They're like the old low power C- uh, Seagate. LPs, um, they're slower RPMs than than the really fast ones that are, that you'd probably want for performance. But even with that, it's still pretty fast. I got something like seven to eight hundred megabytes per second uh, speed on that SAS enclosure, just oh, wow. with these these old drives, which so, is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's like twice as fast, three times as fast as any of the drives that I've this eSATA drives that I have now mm-hmm. that are that are also RAID enclosures. So anyway. It's a uh, long story short. I am now using this populated SAS enclosure to do editing with all my twenty something terabytes of ProRes files on it. So it's I've got my SATA, my SAS card in my Mac. I've got it connected to six eSATA drives uh, with the fan out cables, and then I've got um, one SAS port used for this gigantic SAS en- expander enclosure. Wow, and, and I have more SAS enclosures. Uh, I have another SAS enclosure that I got off eBay on the way. The same one, got it for about the same price. Um, and then also I ordered uh, thirteen six terabyte drives. How many? Uh, thirteen. <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm gonna have. Uh, well, depending how I configure it, I, I'll have like fifty terabytes of. Right. Super super fast storage. That's excellent. 
Yeah. Which 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 will last you for about a month. It'll then, be about a month at this right, rate. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. But uh, yeah, and then eventually my Mac is just gonna go. I'm done. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You've expanded me too much. <laughs> Well, uh, well, that that's a fine update, uh, <laughs> is, especially coming uh, off of uh, uh, what you learned over at OWC. So yeah, I did, and I, f- I, 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 I feel like I tried to order stuff from them, didn't work out, but they really helped a lot, and their stuff is great. And I feel like like the stuff that I'm getting now, the SaaS stuff, I could even use it if a new Mac Pro comes out, or even if I, you know, use a different operating system in the future. At these SaaS enclosures, I think will still be relevant. Right. So I don't think I'm obsoleting myself. I think they're still very, very useful. Oh, I think there's still a lot of growth in, in for the future in that. So that's, yeah. so that's good. Yeah. Hey, I mean, you, you probably thought that way about these two terabyte drives that you had lying around, right? So <laughs> no. So and and look at how how you're going to put them to use. So yeah, they they're that's still a great thing. They're still useful. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Hey, uh, great interview again. The folks from OWC, specifically, thanks to Chris Hafner. Uh, for spending some time with us. Let's um, let's take another time out here and we will come back with more from uh, the Tech Move uh, live coverage of NEB 2017. We'll be right back. In our continuing coverage of NEB 2017, it is Tech Move with Rod Louie and Keith Moreau. And Keith, now what I'd like to do is I'd like to present a uh, another interview that you had so graciously done for us with the fine folks over at Manfrotto. And uh, I think you had met up with, I, I couldn't tell if you knew this guy uh, before, Giuseppe Delaro, I believe, uh, If I, hopefully I'm not butchering it too much, but I think I'm pretty close. I think uh, that's right. Giuseppe... Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, introduces us to a new Manfrotto uh, product Mm -hmm. that looks, you know, pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Did did you know this guy previously, or is this the first time you've ever encountered him? First time I've ever encountered him, I just walked to the Manfrotto booth. I knew I wanted to talk about this particular tripod head. Right. And uh, just found somebody. Usually what I do is I just talk to random people and say, who do I talk to to get an interview? And then they usually point me in the right direction. Anyone with a vendor shirt on, right? Anyone with a vendor shirt, you just say, hey, is somebody willing to get on camera and talk to me? Yeah, yeah. And the thing about uh, the Manfrotto area is there's they're owned by this other company mm-hmm. that pretty much owns every tripod company in existence. And it's kind of like, uh, I think it's Vitek. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, and I think they also own... I mean, I could be totally wrong, but I don't think I am. Let me just look it up. Yeah, it's called the Vitek Group, okay. and they—I'll just tell you like some of the some of the things that they own. Vitek Group is a UK company, mm-hmm. and it's kind of weird because uh, oh, they have different divisions. They have broadcast division, photographic division. So in the broadcast division, Vitek owns Anton Bauer, AutoQ, AutoScript, Bexel, Camera Corps, the Camera Store. Light Panels, O'Connor, Off Hollywood, Paralynx, Sackler, Small HD, Terralink, Vinton, and Wooden Camera. And in the photographic division, they own Avenger, Colorama, Gitso, Lastolite, Manfrotto, and National Geographic. So they own a, a lot of stuff. Wow. So when you so when you go to, so their booth is kind of like a collect it's kinda of like a little city. It's like a collection of all of these different brands and they're all kind of grouped together and so and they have some kind of common representatives but because of that it's kind of chaotic too yeah so um and i think they have a lot of rf uh interference in their booth <laughs> oh is <that> <laughs> <laughs> I think some of their a lot products, of radio waves going on and stuff. Yeah, I think some of their their products are actually broadcasting type products. So okay, there's a lot of there's a lot of interference going on there. Right, as as you'll find out in a couple of the interviews that we did in that booth. <laughs> 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 so anyway, yeah. So so I f- I found this guy. He was really nice. He's he's Italian. He's got a really thick Italian accent. Uh, you know, with a name like Giuseppe. <laughs> 
But my my guess was that he was Italian. That would but be like my not guess. Italian American, like Italian Italian, like right from Italy, right. Um, but his his English was pretty good, and and uh, he knew about his product, and yeah. So why don't we, you know, we could listen to the interview, and then we could talk a little bit about the product after it. Sounds fantastic. Okay, yeah. here we go. It's Giuseppe Delaro from Manfrotto, and our very own Keith Moreau at on the floor of NAB 2017, right here on Tech News. Hi, this is Keith Monroe here for Tech Move at NAB. We've got Giuseppe, is that right? Yeah. Giuseppe of Manfrotto here to talk a little bit about the new revolutionary, what is it called, NitroTech? NitroTech. NitroTech head. Tell us about it. Yeah, it's a completely brand new technology that is uh, equipped with a nitrogen piston mechanism that allow the users to completely counterbalance the camera up to eight kilos. It is equipped with a very easy and uh, easy quick link that allows to very easily connect the camera and then uh, with a knob uh, you counterbalance very quickly the, uh, the camera and you have the camera always where counterbalance no matter the angle that you have uh, during the shooting. What happens normally with the other uh, heads, uh, especially with the one, for example, with uh, uh, the steps, uh, is that you have the camera that is counterbalanced only on a specific angle. Instead, with NitroTech, you have uh, the, your camera always well counterbalanced. So what is the NitroTech technology? What is that? Yeah, it's a nitrogen piston that you can see here, okay, that basically push against the base and try to uh, make a force that is opposite against the weight. So uh, basically when you see the piston is just uh, completely down, it means that it's not uh, counterbalancing the camera. Instead, uh, if you have, for example, a very heavy uh, camera, like for example, an eight kilo payload camera, you will see that the piston will be completely out because we need uh, the max ma maximum power in terms of force in order to get uh, the camera well counterbalanced. Oh, that's amazing. So how is this compared weight-wise with other type of technology? It's a completely different new. It's not possible to compare because uh, we don't use uh, any kind of uh, spring. We don't use any kind of uh, mechanical stuff. It's just a matter of the nitrogen that is uh, in, inside the piston. And then it's just a matter to manage it uh, through the knob. That's so what does the knob do? Sorry? What does this knob do? Oh, it's just the knob is just uh, increase uh, or decrease uh, the height of the piston. So we allow the, the nitrogen to get uh, uh, much space or less space. And in this case, we uh, enlarge or decrease the force that the piston go against uh, the, the camera, basically. And so what, what would be the maximum weight that you would recommend? Uh, we have up eight kilos, so we, this uh, kind of head is, uh, it can be used with mirrorless camera, but also with the camcorder. So no matter what kind of camera they will use, it's just a matter to understand the total weight of the camera configuration that they will use on the head. How much does the actual head weigh? Uh, the head itself is uh, two kilos basically. So it's very lightweight because we try to uh, follow the trend. So the camera is becoming uh, smaller and smaller and uh, uh, the performance are increasing. We have now uh, 8K, 4K uh, cameras. And so we try to uh, develop uh, a, a, a head that is uh, very lightweight and that is able to counterbalance even the lightweight cameras like uh, mirrorless. And uh, is this available now? Yes, absolutely. It's available on uh, uh, stores and e-commerce as well, and also on our Manfrotto websites. And what is this? What does it cost? Uh, the head itself is four four nine US dollars. Wow, it sounds like a really amazing deal. Yeah, it is. Um, and regarding the technology, say for back and for the panning. What technology are you using for that? Yeah, for this part, we have the Manfrotto Drag Fluidity System. So that allows to have uh, a very smooth pan and tilt movement. And uh, we have identified two areas where the users can manage the pan fluidity. So they can understand if they want uh, a very smooth or if you want to increase the fluidity on the head. And uh, also on the lateral side, uh, they can check and uh, manage the fluidity from this part and they can lock the tilt movement in a specific angle if they want to be sure about that uh, kind of shooting. 
That's great. Well, thanks so much, Seppi, for all the great information. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Keith Moreau signing off for Tech Move. And that's Tech Move reporting from the Manfrotto booth at NAB 2017 with Giuseppe Delaro and Keith Moreau. Uh, I really like that head. Yeah, it's it's actually... It's going to be a fortune, though. I know that. It's going to be a actually, fortune. No, no. Actually, it's really cheap. It's it's amazingly cheap. It's like four or five hundred dollars. Are you in the market for one of those? Are you going to get well, one of those? You know what's kind of cool about it is it's very. It holds up a lot of weight for its size. Yep. So, and the thing that's I and mean, then we talked about it in the in the show, but basically it's got this gas nitrogen powered piston. Correct. That it's kind of like the spring mechanism, but instead of a spring, it's using this piston and. And I guess it, because of that, it can be very, very powerful. Um, I don't know the reliability of a piston over time, you know, or like if you had it in the heat and the sun, you know, like tripods occasionally get. Right. Um, is it going to explode, you know? Or, uh, you know, what, does it have like a little beeping sound when it's about to explode? Um, <laughs> you know, like a that'd, phaser. That'd be great if, uh, <laughs> if a head actually had that. It would be kind of like if, if you're like James Bond and you have an emergency and you're posing as a photographer or something, right. you can right. you can set set the safety off on the nitro head. Exactly. But um, but anyway, I mean, I, the reliability and all that remains to be seen. But it's an it's an amazingly innovative thing, and this is the kind of stuff that 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 changes whole industries in a way, because for like literally like a hundred years, heads have been kind of counter tensioned in the same way with these big coils of st- springs inside of them right um and and now uh we have this other method of doing it and so uh because of that it's also lighter you know because air doesn't or gas doesn't really weigh anything in fact it might actually be making it more buoyant right <laughs> yeah exactly right yep. just slightly yeah t- uh, taking a little bit of that extra <laughs> friction off right um and anyway, so it's about in the four to five hundred dollar range, and but it's it's still pretty s- fairly small and light. So I I'm kind of concerning it maybe for a, a B, a B camera, uh, head, or B tripod head, and and just having that as an extra since it's kind of small and light. It's not mm. that small, but it's certainly light. So yeah, it's it's possible. It's possible. Great. I mean, I'll play with it more at the next like it's in a year or something. Yeah. Uh, get a better look at it at at Cinegear and you know, um, what, but, what but I wa- it looked really good. Yeah, what I want to do is I want to just hold it on its own when it's detached from a tripod and just to see how heavy it is. Then we'll get a good idea. I will say, um, you know, I hope the listeners weren't too distracted by the bits of RF noise that were there. But uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, gas powered uh, tripod heads. There is going to be some RF noise, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, that, that hey, that's just the way technology goes. You know what I mean? <laughs> so anyway, good. Uh, oh, I, you know, I e- either e- either I forgot what he said, uh, or I just wasn't paying attention. <laughs> uh, is that is the head available now? Um, I don't think he said it, and I'm not sure if it is. So um, I, I'm, I, you know, uh, that that will be one of your assignments at Cinegear, is to uh, find out when that uh, actually hits the market. I'm actually just looking it up now and seeing oh, if there's okay. any. It is it is available now. Oh, it is it, 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 for shipping and everything. Yeah, it's shipping out of our some of our favorite uh, mail order places. Terrific. It's Four forty nine. Terrific. What 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 what's the technical name of the uh, of the head? It's called the Manfrotto Nitrotech N A N eight. Sorry, Nitrotech N eight video head. Fantastic. Yeah. Great. And Great. it's got two. Well, this one site's got two reviews on it, and the reviews are uh, one's one's a two star and one's a five star. Oh. So one guy was upset because it couldn't counterbalance anything more than three point five kilogram, which is fairly light actually mm-hmm. you know it's like seven pounds mm-hmm. um they say it goes up to like 20 pounds or 30 pounds like an amazing amount right so 
Um, so I, I may actually just try it out because that's like in the FS7 range with just you know, hardly anything on it. Right. So we'll see. We'll okay. see. Okay. All right. Yeah. Good. I'm going to test it out. Good. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that one. Mm-hmm. Again, thanks to the folks at Manfrotto. And uh, we will come back with more of NAB 2017 right here on Tech Move. This is Keith Monroe here for Tech Move. I'm here at NAB, and I've actually got, I actually bumped into a celebrity here. Oh, there is an reference. And this is actually Matt Workman. And I was just uh, doing a little interview with the Manfrotto marketing person. And it turns out that, that Matt is also working as an ambassador for Manfrotto. I am, yes. And Matt is actually a famous YouTuber. He's also a pretty renowned uh, DP. And he has a product, uh, Cinematog- Cinematography Database. Cinematography Database is the company and the YouTube channel. Check it out. And the product is Cine Designer. But I understand the confusion in the terms. Cinematography in general is a bad branding. T- it's hard to spell. I spell it wrong. But those are, that's what they are, yeah. So tell me just a little bit about your background and then about how you got involved with Manfrotto and just other, anything else you want to talk about. Sure. So I was a commercial cinematographer in New York City for about 10 years. And I started to use 3D to help just communicate with my clients and my directors kind of for fun. You know, I had a 3D background. And I was just doing it for fun just to see if it would help, if, if using 3D could help communicate lighting and camera because that's what I was doing as a DP mostly, you know, at a certain level. And I did it for about five years, and it got to the point where it was a really good system. And I decided that I would take the leap and maybe just turn it into a product and send it out to the world. And then in the yeah. end, a company, a software startup, essentially, the effort to market it turned into a podcast, a YouTube channel, a blog. But then a year and a half later, the YouTube channel has 100,000 subscribers. Instagram is 60,000. And it's its own marketing force for the film in general. And so that's led me to collaborate with companies like Manfrotto. I'm also an ambassador for Aperture um, and kind of just rapidly working with as many. So there's a big blank where he's talking about the community. And I think he's talking about the cinematography community in general. Yeah, that's what I was kind of getting from it. Um, so we can maybe when we interview Matt for the real interview in the future, we can ask him what he meant there. But I think that's what he. Yes. Meant. No, I, and, and and you know it'll it'll be uh it, it'll be very interesting when we get him in more of a studio situation rather than a, you know, th- than a conference hall type of yeah, thing. Yeah, this is kind of like an a little bit of an anthropological archaeological mission to reconstruct what Matt said. But we'll get right. we'll. Uh, We'll get him in person, and then we can have him interpret what he said. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure probably by then he'll be an ambassador to France pretty soon. So that, that, yes. that that's okay. He doesn't have to be just an ambassador to Manfrotto or anything like that. He can be an ambassador to actually some real yeah. country. And then he so. might be speaking French, but that's okay. We'll, that's that's we'll correct. We'll interpret well, it at that point. We'll, 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 we'll be hearing uh, our other foreign language <laughs> folks very shortly from what I understand. So. Okay, we're going to start the c- recording again now. Okay, here we go. Uh-huh. Uh, with the yeah. all present in that, I can also make content around it. So that's been my DP to whatever it is you would you would explain this is. I don't. Uh, as, um, I, I'm I'm getting into the gist of your next question, but I really having a hard time understanding what that question <laughs> is. I know there's a lot of pointing with somewhere you yeah. know over you know, over to your yeah. right. And I think it, I th- what I said was really hilarious, but Matt did I'm sure Matt it was. Matt didn't respond because I think he's just... Well, I think, he was hear- I think he was hearing the interference in the <laughs> microphones. <laughs> anyway, so I'm at five... I'm at uh, 220. Where are you? I'm at 226. Okay, let me back up a little I, bit. Oh, uh, okay. let, me, let me back okay, up. Okay, so this is play. <laughs> okay, here we go. So, Presty, most of the show... I mean, obviously, this fluid had... Or this gas-powered head is pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I might have to go, um, you know, go to the air station at the gas station to fill it up sometime, but maybe not. But uh, tell me a little bit, of, a little bit about this and this, some of the other amazing things that you've seen at the show. Well, I've been at Boots for most of the show, so I haven't been able to see as much as I would really want to. You know, they reached out to me, and I, I like Manfrotto as a brand. One, how it looks. I've always liked how they looked. I own like their older heads. They don't make them anymore, like 701. HDV, 501 HDV, I have those. You know, they were four oh, wow. good, you know, so it was, a, it was a value, so I like that. So they reached out to me and they were like, hey, we're making a more 
video head. You know, we know that you have an audience of people that do video. And would you check it out and possibly do a review for it and, you know, make a film about it? And I checked it out and I was like, this is great. And it's affordable. So it's like 450 for the head. It's counterbalanced, very similar to how a Sackler head would be or an O'Connor head. But those tripods can be, you know, 3000 to $8,000 for their smaller ones. So they came in in a nice place in the market to give us the features of the bigger heads at a lightweight and affordable price. And, like, and that's a great thing. And I'm all for supporting companies that do that, which is why I also like Aperture. I think that they're also making high quality lights, but they're making it consciously to keep the prices down for consumers. And I, I see them doing that as well. And I, I can see this being like the number one tripod head for the next while, given the price point. There's really nothing else at it. And the fact that it can counterbalance, you know, an FS7 II, which is like one of the most popular cameras in the industry right now, it's great. So they, they did a good job and I was happy to work with them on it. So um, back to your product. Sure. Um, so are you like a software engineer geek or something like that? Yeah, so I went to college for computer science and electrical engineering. I got like three years through it and then decided to be a filmmaker, mom. I'm going to make movies. Yeah. Oh. City. I mean, like hell for a couple. So I think he said New York City. He was he was based in New York City. Yes, yeah, you heard that. I, I, I got oh. that. I got that actually early from the very start oh, okay. of the uh, uh, from the interview, okay. where he indicated that uh, that that's where he got his start in in filmmaking. Okay, so we're gonna. But but but, but I do like the I, I do like hearing about his educational background, yeah. and then just see that's probably two weeks away from graduation, he decided to become a filmmaker. Yeah, I was like, hey. That's I'm not cool. going to be a, a coder. I'm going to be a film, and then later he's a coder. But he's still kind of and a filmmaker too, so which is kind of cool. Yeah. So, we, 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 which I think actually has a lot of great advantages when you're when you're doing film, as you know, as in your uh, computer background has has helped you a, a great deal oh, yeah. with with a lot of this. My stuff. geekiness has definitely helped. Yes. Me. So that, and Absolutely. I don't think he knows how much of a geek I am. He thinks I'm just asking him geeky questions, but uh, later right. I'll probably. You know, reveal to him my you, d dazzle him <laughs> with your with your coding. Yeah. Just uh, just dazzle him with yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I'm gonna, we're gonna start playing again. Here we go. I'm at four sixteen. Where are you at? Okay. okay. Start start right now. Well, you're doing that, and eventually, somehow by clawing, and you know, social media was a big part of it. Just like how my this my company, I, I was able to get in. Creo que creo que like. You know, Facebook and Google, BMW. Oh, ¿cuál es la vista que... I think that's I was Japanese. Japanese. Just like a whole bunch of people, just 10 years of just slogging it out in New York City. Wasn't pretty in the beginning. Um, I forget what the... But that's... that's. Are you a geek? Yeah, so I'm a geek. But the whole time, it's always been like, you know, how do I mix like my computer science background with filmmaking? Like, how can I put these two things together? You know, like now 10 years into it, in like post graduation or being a freelancer or whatever. Okay. Yeah, so, so we, 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 we missed a lot of we, that transition yeah. from how we went from uh, computer science to... Uh, yeah, yeah, we missed a lot uh, of that. And I kind of remember what he said. Uh -huh. He was just talking about uh, how, how he was kind of continuing on with mixing um, the, geek, the geekery with the, with the filmmaking. And kind of kind okay. of merging it together, I, I think I if we had, we had recorded this like right after I, we did the interview, this interpretation right. I would have had a better memory of what he said. <laughs> sure, 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 definitely. But uh, but I think uh, yeah, he was just kind of too much time is elapsed. Too much time, too much time. I mean, you probably don't even remember. I'm 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 glad you remembered if it, uh, who he was in the first place. <laughs> I guess if it wasn't for titling the clip, you probably wouldn't know anyway. So that's good. yeah, yeah. But we'll have him fill yeah. in the blanks later when we do the forensic analysis of this recording. Yes, that'll be so. good. Well, we'll do we'll do a little voice mapping and 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 uh, figure we'll, that we'll out. We'll bring the lip readers in. And That's the, uh, right. What do they call those people that that uh, there were like a couple TV shows about people that could just look at a crime scene and kind of know what happened? Oh, like CSI kind type of, CSI, of uh, thing. crime 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 scene investigation. Kind of more like of that, person. but more metaphysical. I don't remember what they were called. It uh, wasn't the Ghost Whisperer, but. Anyway, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> now that's very good. All right, very good. All right, we're gonna start again. Here we go. Okay. So, are you like going home and and doing like uh, programming in uh, Objective C plus plus or something like that? I do know C plus plus. I don't like to do it. I'm not working in Swift for iOS development or anything like that. I mostly work in Python. If this is turning to a uh, a programming podcast. Punta Teradec en NAB 2017. 
Manolo de la Serna es quien nos está acompañando. Manolo, ¿cómo estás? Yeah, yeah. Buenísimo. Don't have to change anything about that. Hay aquí veo bastantes equipos. So this is where Cuéntanos, Matt's, porfa. For some reason, switches to Spanish. And starts yes. talking. Because maybe, I don't know, maybe when he programs in Python, he programs in Python in the Spanish uh, dialect. I'm not sure. But uh, did you pause? I just I paused, paused, yes. Okay. Well, uh, I'm more, I'm 90, you know, frankly, you know, Matt, Matt, Matt Workman, I'm certainly happy that he joined the podcast, <laughs> but I'm frankly much more distracted by the guy in the background wearing the Riddler outfit. <laughs> where is he? I don't know if you see that, no, where is but he? there, there, there is a guy in the background who is essentially wearing a Riddler outfit. Wait, is he is he moving? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, he's he he's he's loitering out there in that Manfrotto uh, booth out there. So where are you now, time wise? I'm at uh, five five forty five. Okay, so I'm at five thirty seven. So let me let me okay go. Go, go 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 up to five forty five and then pause it. The Riddler. I don't see the Riddler at five forty five. You you, you 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 don't see him. Are you are you are you sure? <laughs> he is wearing the most obnoxious ta- outfit. Oh, the guy in the the brownish shirt. No, no. He, he 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 he. Very green. Very. Um, I'm trying to. Are you seeing it? Where you, you're at five forty five and so so I am I you you he would be right behind Matt. He would be right behind at five forty five. Oh yeah uh, yeah with the weird shirt. Way in the background. I don't know if it's a shirt. Hang on. At I'm at five thirty five now. I went back to five thirty five, and he's yeah. He's but he's and he's but just he's just kind of staring. He's just kind of staring there. He's just like standing in one spot. Yeah. Right, but just that jacket is just horrible. Whatever he's wearing, he should take it off and burn it. That's funny because I didn't. I never even noticed him. So it's interesting how different people notice different right. things. Well, o- o- only because I'm such a fashion plate. <laughs> That I, you know, that like Joan Rivers, I will comment on people's attire. So, uh, and that guy needs to go to a different continent. Okay, but not Matt. Because, Matt's uh, in a nice, tasteful gray. Matt's fine. Yeah. Matt, 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 Matt Keith Moreau is even better. <laughs> but uh, uh, Matt Workman is fine. But uh, you know, uh, you know, for for those who know who the Riddler is, <laughs> I didn't know he made guest appearances at. NAB 2017. I yeah. did not know. There that. were some. There, Elvis was there too. There yes. was. But anyway, yeah. um, okay. So we'll just so, continue on to the end. It's almost uh, over. I, 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 I'm at 5:43. I'm going to continue okay. now. Uh, yeah, he's a geek. So, <laughs> um, well, I, I think you might have to go to something else. You were mentioning that you were late for something. So I really appreciate your time, Matt. I'd, I'd love to actually interview you for the podcast. Sure. Well, send me this wherever this goes. We'll send you this. Well, and I will. I will. I'll do it. Awesome. Thanks so much. Keep Pro signing off for Tech. Okay. Hey, that 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 was that was very very good, and it it looked like he was actually uh, amenable to uh to actually come back to the show. Oh yeah, I'm sure that he's not so much of a standoffish celebrity that he won't he won't come back. He's he's no, I, I and and. And I and I think that that's fan, fantastic, and uh, uh, I, you know I would love to hear a little bit more of that background, and uh, I think that would be very very interesting. Yeah. very interesting. Yeah. So I guess the Spanish, uh, you know, subtitles. I don't know if they will help or not, or the English subtitles will help or not for the Spanish parts where Matt well, was speaking Spanish. Well, considering the fact that you don't even know what he was saying in <laughs> English. Is is going to be a problem? You That's know? true. It's a pretty uh, specific part where the Spanish guy comes in when he's talking right. about programming and, languages. And, and you know, if we do want him back onto the show, we would probably have to be fairly accurate as far as what he was saying. Otherwise, he might bring us or bring a lawsuit against us or something. Oh, so no, no, no re- reinterpretation of what he said. Well, I, I, I you know, I, I would say probably nothing insulting. <laughs> That's for darn sure. <laughs> Um, no, you know. he was really cool. Um, yeah, you know, I liked him a lot. I like his personality is exactly the same as on, on the show. Well, tell me a little bit about yeah. this. Let, let, let's tell some of our <clears throat> listeners a little bit about Matt Workman. What uh, uh, what what draws you to 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 watching some of his uh, uh, product? Well, I was really drawn drawn to him because I just basically love to listen to podcasts about cinematography, kind of like kind of yes. our podcast, kind of like tech yeah, move, like tech move. And right. and there's a, there's not that many out there. There's only right. you know like a handful, maybe ten or less. So, <clears throat> and there used to be even less. It seems like there's more now. Like 
Well, that's because of it's pretty much is. They're just saying, oh, these guys are super right. successful. Let's just right. latch onto their coattails and start that's our right. own. I'm that's sure right. that's what Matt did, that's right. right? Oh, but um, <laughs> no doubt. No but doubt. Uh, yeah, so I just and his his podcast started maybe two something years ago, and I think he doesn't doing it anymore because you know how much much work it is. But he does have a YouTube channel that kind of took off from that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I guess in the sa- meantime, he was also talking. To, he was also promoting his pr- his program, his Cine. Mm-hmm. I think it's called Cine Designer. I think it's called. I still, mm. I'm still confused about the name, but I have to look it up, um, and we'll put it in the, the notes. But anyway, yeah. So that's pretty cool. So because it's this 3D designing program where you can set up your lights and stuff, it like pre mm. pre vis uh, lighting setup. So. Oh, yeah. okay. So so, so it, it, almost like a pre production type of uh, a tool. Yeah, yeah, it's it's actually pretty cool because you can decide what what size and style of light. You know the diffusion. I think it's the diffusion, the placement angle, and and like how 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 uh, bright it is, and other stuff in the scene. And then you can really map out how the light's going to react to the people, shadow and lighting wise. Oh, that's yeah. great. So I think actually a lot of cinematographers are using it now. So I think he's getting oh, some good. traction and. But in the meantime, mm-hmm. I think his because of this, he's he's personally getting a lot of, I think he's getting a lot of um, engagements from companies like Manfrotto and Aperture, two huge companies. Be, being these ambassadors and such. Yeah, like that. he's just got this following mm-hmm. now, so I think people trust him and trust his opinion. And, and his and his YouTube channel is pretty cool. I listen to it like when I work out and stuff. I watch it when I work out, and he, and he goes mm-hmm. through like the cinematography of certain scenes of movies and things like that. So, yeah, oh, cool. I would recommend it. It's it's pretty cool, and he seems like a cool guy. And, uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's doing really well. So. Great. Good. Excellent. Well, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, apologize for the interference <laughs> that we got, uh, uh, to the audio, but, uh, Keith, uh, an, an, another great interview. Thank you for locking down Matt Workman. <laughs> And uh, let's, uh, let's take another break and we'll, uh, get another interview going okay. here. Uh, we'll come right back on uh, this episode of Tech News. We're back here on our NAB 2017 special extravaganza. <laughs> uh, Keith, I cannot believe you got uh, this uh, coveted guest. Oh, and, yeah. And uh, we're, we're, we're so uh, happy to have him as part of the Tech Move podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is a interview that I know you had to go through uh, a lot of hoops, <laughs> a lot of uh, red tape to get. But I appreciate you in your journalistic skills <laughs> by going out there and snagging uh, probably uh, one of the most uh, admired, uh, revered, and popular uh, DPs out there, uh, who in some ways has slowed down a little bit. I think he, I think he's gotten so big that I think he probably was spending more of his time uh, uh, doing reviews than he was actually doing the work that he really wants to do. And uh, I am speaking about the one and only Philip Bloom. Um, uh, do you agree with me that he's kind? Of, he, he seems to have slowed down his presence a little bit uh, on the internet and stuff. Yeah, I think he's just too busy to do all this free stuff for everybody. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 mean, I mean, true. I, I I think he'd rather do, you know, the things he likes to do, like filmmaking or something. Yeah, I think he. I think it's a combination of it. It starts getting kind of old after a while. Yeah, and then also just lack of time. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So. Um, yeah, but, um, but still I do I watch his site and he has, he, everything he does is really revealing and really informative. And I like also following his career, you know, I, um, with Philip, you know, I started following him like in 2007, I think. Wow. Yeah. And, and this was, so we were all around 2007, the 5D Mark II had not come out. And, uh, so we we're all still filming with our small sensor camcorders <laughs> right right um you know trying to trying to somehow get more filmic look out of it you know maybe by recording at 24p with the the uh i think this was the dvx 100 uh but still it was not it was like film but with with still very deep depth of field yeah like those little sensor cameras do yeah and um and philip was really in pursuit of this this film look and he actually went to the point of getting this adapter that you'd put on the front of your camera 
called a lettuce uh, adapter, mm-hmm. which which allow it was this huge thing that had this mirror in it, this mirror and the spinning ground glass, and you, it had a like EF mount on the front or Nikon mount on the front. You could get different styles, and <clears throat> and then you could actually put a regular SLR lens on it, and you could make your whatever uh, camcorder look like a well, it looks like look like a DSLR, but those didn't exist then. So, <laughs> <laughs> look like a film camera, uh-huh. look like a large like a cinema camera, and so I actually got one of these things based on his, you know, his his use of it, and I used it a little bit. Um, but anyway, so that was kind of my first foray, and then from then on, I would just continually follow his 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 career and his blog. Yeah, and uh, so I thought, f- and usually before these NAB shows for the last few years, I've been contacting somebody and and doing like a an interview before the nab show like a pre-interview type of thing well just just kind of like the show before our tech move uh before nab is like the interview Uh one where we we do somebody famous like like it was it's been a few different people in the past few years okay and i want i i really and i've talked to you about it Right, I remember a while back, I really wanted to get Philip Bloom for that pre-NEB interview. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Oh, we've and been that, working on this for a long time. Sure. Yeah. And so I tried emailing him. I tried, I pretty much used all the ways in social media to contact him. Right. With, <laughs> and, without looking weird and, and having him get a restraining order on you. Which I think maybe he did anyway. Sure. But uh, <laughs> I got one response from his assistant. All the others are automated responses. Yes. Like, I'm Philip Bloom and I'm, I'm kind of busy now, but I'll get back to you. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I actually got one live response from some assistant of his, but she never, I, I asked her to try to get it to him and she just said he was really busy and he'd try and that was it. Yeah. So I just had kind of gave up and we didn't have that pre NAB interview thing, but, um, just by sheer luck, it wasn't journalistic skill or anything. It was just luck that behind the small HD booth when I was doing the interview with Wes Phillips of small HD, mm-hmm. they had this kind of booth set up outside because they wanted to demonstrate their outdoor monitors, their high brightness monitors. Yes. And and lo and behold, Philip Bloom is also checking out their monitors. Oh, wow. And, yeah, and he's like royalty. So he's in the right. back. He's in the back being entertained by his entourage and everybody, like all the... Bowing at his feet, yeah, and stuff pretty much like that. fawning all over him yes. and everything. Yes. But at the very at the same time, Wes Phillips is a super nice guy. I really like him. Is giving me this interview, mm-hmm. and I, I kind of I'm kind of like looking like looking at Philip Bloom as I'm interviewing Wes, and and trying to be into the being into the interview with Wes. But I'm also kind of at the corner of my eye seeing Philip in the background and really tracking what he's doing, right? Because I really want to snag him somehow. I'm sure that will hardly come through in the interview with uh, with Wes. I'm sure no. it will hardly come through. No, I think I mask it pretty well. You did it well? Okay. Yeah, good. yeah. I mean, I'll I was, be he, the judge of that. He was good and engaging and right. stuff, but I was still really, I just didn't want to want Philip to leave. So as soon as the interview was over with Wes. All right, Wes, let me shove you aside. <laughs> hey, Philip, come on over here. <laughs> no, we entered <laughs> kind of like that. Right, kind but of. It, no, it wasn't like that. It was like, I didn't like run over and knock over Wes on the way to Philip. It wasn't right. exactly like that. <laughs> <It> was... <laughs> well, you know what? I would have. So there you go. Uh, it wasn't exactly like right. that. I'm sorry, Wes. Sorry for the tread marks. Right. But um, no, it wasn't like that. But I did ask. I said to him, oh, that's that's Philip Bloom, isn't it? And and he's, yeah, he's he's actually kind of a friend of Small HD's and checking out our monitors now. So I said, yeah, I'm going to try to snag. He said, yeah, you should. You should try to talk to him. You know what? I'm sure it wasn't like that. At all. I'm sure it was like, hey, Wes, that's Philip Bloom. Yeah, it is. There he is again. <laughs> <laughs> he gets that kind of treatment everywhere he goes, man. Why couldn't it be me? Uh, but uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe later. That's how I would have done it. But, maybe later. You know, but, but they they all seem really friendly. Oh yeah, I'm, 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 I'm sure. Hey, you know, it's a big community, but it's also a small community when you get to a certain level, right? I th- so, yeah, I think you're so right. So you so you obviously start knowing people, and you know, just like people out there, no tech move, and, and that's why you get all the great interviews, Keith. That's why you get all the great interviews. Either that, or it's just blind luck, like this time, right? But, <laughs> but which is you know a lot of life is luck so take you know take take your advantage of it when it happens so i i did so as soon as we got entered the in- interview i i just pretty much stalked philip bloom and he was he was at the 
booth just talking with any any after a while i think he knew that i was there yeah because he was kind of like almost purposely ignoring me right <laughs> sure uh, but then he he has i think it's his girlfriend her name's sarah and because if you look at his, his instagram and some other things she's all over oh. his, his feed and and she's also a photographer too so i think that's their connection um but um she was really nice and she was kind of on the side while philip was looking at all the stuff and chatting it up with the folks and she was kind of involved but a little less so than philip and so i kind of like used the opportunity to start talking to her a little bit mm. and i said oh you know i'm tr i'm trying to i was trying to get this interview with philip i'm a huge fan i've been his fan for like 10 years and i wanted to get this interview for my podcast and i think i, I think i know who you are because i think i've seen him on your feed and she introduced herself she was a really sweet nice person and her name's sarah and uh Anyway, so I think that kind of got his attention because I was like, figure out like how can I somehow inject myself into this? So, besides uh, clubbing him over the head, <laughs> like dragging him by his heels, right. no, Philip, right. interview me, <laughs> interview, please. Put him under house arrest and put him in an interrogation room, and there's your interview. <laughs> it was almost like that. So anyway, so one time Philip kind of like turned around to go to another part of the booth, and I just said, Philip. If you, would you be able to possibly give me a couple of minutes? He's yeah, yeah, in a couple of minutes. Give me, give me a minute. Mm -hmm. So he went back to his thing, and then after about like three or four minutes, he finally turned around and said, "Okay, I got time now." Oh wow! Yeah, fantastic. So, yeah, hey, that's a great story. <laughs> yeah, that's a great story. Well, you know, hey, let's 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 not prolong this anymore, <laughs> uh, because I'm sure that uh, that whole story to get to Philip is longer <laughs> than the actual interview. So way way longer. So let let let's uh, let, let's let's do this, Keith. Let's uh, let's go ahead and hear this interview, and let's come back, and we'll talk about it for, for a couple of minutes. Okay. So uh, let's do this. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen, a, a world exclusive <laughs> right here on Tech Move. It is a 2017 interview with Philip Bloom done by our very own Keith Moreau, and you're hearing it only right here on Tech Move. This is well, a super well, high, had. super high tech recording device. Okay. Got one of my uh, idols here, Philip Bloom. How are you? Doing? I'm Keith Moreau, Philip. Hi, Keith. How are you? I'm good. I actually, have been emailing you for the last month and a half. Have you? About what? About doing this? Yeah. About, you, about, got me. you found me. <laughs> I know you're a super busy guy. Um, how's your show been so far? Uh, it's not my show. It belongs to <laughs> NAB, but you know, <laughs> it's been fun. Yeah. It's 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 uh, I, they're exa it's exhausting, isn't it? The show. But no, I've enjoyed it so far. Um, I finished my talks, which is great, so I get a chance now to look around. So I'm here at Small Night Shades. First, first job I've had to look at anything. And so what do, you, what do you think of this new monitors? They're, they're crazy. I mean, the thing is about these daylight viewable screens in bright sunshine, they're great for this. But in England, we don't need that. We don't have sunshine. Just a normal screen's fine. But they look amazing. So yeah, I can't wait to actually try one on a shoot. Be fun. So have you had a chance to do anything at the show other than your talks? Nothing apart from... I had a chance to have a couple, uh, say hi to people. I've done a few draws, but no, no, I've not had a chance to look at anything yet. And this is literally the first place I've come to. Okay, so I want to tell you, Philip, why I've been trying to get in touch with you because I've actually followed you from 2006, 2007. I even emailed you a couple times and you responded back then. Yeah, I, I used to respond to you. Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> okay. But um, I, I think I got the uh, the lettuce extreme adapter oh, wow. because you, you recommended it. and. Right. After the five D came out, I got rid of that immediately. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's a good, a good smart move. <laughs> but I was lugging that thing around with the, to get that that full frame. Yeah. Uh, shallowed yeah, up the it field. Was great. Uh, and I'm, I actually dug mine out the other day. I thought about even trying to connect it up to a camera if I could find one. I have an EX3 somewhere. I don't know where, but I should dig it out. I wouldn't mind just seeing and reminding myself of just how much we struggled back in those days to get that look and how easy it is now with cameras to get that look. We Spe have it so easy. Speaking of that luck, what's your what are your favorite little little cameras these days? How is little is little? Littlest. iPhone. Well, iPhone 7 will be my littlest camera. Uh, uh, but then the RX105 will be my next big up, which is a really nice camera. And then we move on to say the A7S2, which is of course an amazing camera. Yeah, I've I've actually got the A7S2, the A7R2. Yeah, the A7R2 is my favorite walk around camera. Because there's great stills and great video, so yeah. And I just got the GH5. And I've got a GH5 as well. Which what is do you bigger. think? It's bigger than the A7 camera. It's amazing. It's got great features, but I don't like the image as much as the A7s. But it's got better features. 
But at the end of the day, it's all about the image. And for me, the A7 has a nicer image. But um, the H5, it's feature-wise, it's incredible. If you could just somehow get the uh, the codec of the GH5 into the A7, that would be awesome. Yeah, I'm always I, I speak to Sony a lot, um, and even today I had a meeting with them, and they asked me what I want, and I told them basically the GH5 features in an A7 body on that sensor. So. What they say? And uh, they, they said okay, okay. <laughs> and then I said full, then I said uh, full frame video camera, full frame video camera. Now then I said medium format A7 style camera. And what did they say? And they went okay, okay. <laughs> Well, you know, all these, all these inputs, I'm sure, help. Yeah. So uh, what are you going to do next? Uh, I, have a, I have to be at Fuji stand to uh, give away a lens, and then uh, back to the hotel, change, go for dinner, go to the music bed party, go to bed, get up again, and do it all again tomorrow. So you're super busy, aren't you? Yeah, I've got to go. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thanks, so much. It's very, very nice meeting thanks, you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really have to go, but it's no, no worries. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. This is Keith Moreau from TechMove. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a world exclusive here <laughs> on Tech Move. Uh, Keith Moreau interviewing uh, what probably is the holy grail of the uh, digital filmmaking world, uh, Philip Bloom on uh, Tech Move Airwaves. And uh, <laughs> Keith, uh, what a coup. That was terrific. And that was a great interview. I really, I really, really liked it. Uh, I, I do have to say it was kind of cute uh, actually watching the video because it was very much uh, you were acting almost as much uh, like I did when I met Mickey Mouse uh, when I was eight <laughs> years old uh, at Disneyland. So that was kind of cute. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, hey, you know, Philip Bloom, fantastic. You know, in just that, you know, short three minute little clip. I, I really found it very interesting that um, as great as the GH5 is, he's still on the uh, A7 bandwagon. Yep. yep. You know? I, I think that's true. And I, and I, you know, the thing about Philip is it's all about image. Right. You know, you can just, it, you can have all the features in the world, but image is king. Yeah. And he's right. I mean, I I have the GH5. I'm using it, but I would never choose it over the A7R2 or S2 for image. It's just not as good good an image. Interesting. Even even though it's 10 bit recording and it's got all this, you know, extra color in the codec. Yeah. The the final result, if you look at the the results on both both cameras side by side, you can tell the difference. The the A7s have much more depth, um, much more I don't know organic tones to them. The the GH five it, it looks way better than the GH four, mm -hmm. um, much cleaner, much much better. Um, I think dynamic range even, but <clears throat> and the codec and all the features in the camera are really awesome. But image wise, it's just a little bit a little bit cheaper looking, a little mm. bit more a little bit more video looking than the than the A sevens. And so, so yeah, so so I, I I guess Panasonic. I mean, we're we're getting pretty close, but it's just that that Sony train just keeps plowing through, huh? I think so. You know, I think a lot of it comes down to the sensor. You know, yeah. it's it's the sensor, and it's all that technology and all that expertise and 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 years and years of experience. Um, I mean, but but as far as image quality goes, A sevens. Are really really good. They've really they really hit it with the A7 IIs especially. They're 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 great. The GH5 is great. There are a couple things in it that I don't like. Um, I'm using I'm but I would I would just never I'd probably just never choose it over an A7. You know. Right. Just like if I had a choice, like here's here's one or there. Which one are you gonna have? It's a great camera for like long recordings and of them in certain situations. But I'm not gonna pick it up and use that as my first camera. I'm always gonna pick up my A7R2. Yeah, so you know. so GH five is going to be one of those things. Set it up in the back of the room. You'll be able to crop in. It'll look fantastic. It'll do the trick. Uh, but as far as everything else, you're 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 going with the uh, with the A sevens. Pretty much, yeah. The A sevens are equivalent to my best A cameras. Mm -hmm. You know, my best. You know, it's they're the best image cameras I have right now, which is kind of hard to believe, but they're the best image cameras I have, okay. considering I've spent more for other ones. Right. But uh, yeah, I'm still willing to put up with the eight bit. Still willing to put up with, you know, other 
uh, DSLR uh, lack of features and lack of video controls in some cases. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so he was right. He's right. Fantastic. He's got great eye. Hey, yeah. fantastic. Hey, that's yeah. that's why uh, uh, that's why we love him, and we're certainly grateful that he joined us, even for just a, a few moments uh with us here so again congratulations keith thanks for getting that one yep. uh let's take another break and we'll come back with more of our coverage of neb 2017 with keith moreau and rod louie we will be right back Well, ladies and gentlemen, because you've been such a great listening audience, we've decided to stop punishing you by having <laughs> this uh, podcast go on any further. Uh, because we, uh, you know, Keith, you did such a great job. We still have oodles and oodles of content remaining. Uh, we've barely scratched the surface of all of these interviews that you were able to get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh so folks, you know what we what we decided to do is that we're gonna split up NAB two thousand seventeen uh into two episodes here on on Tech Move. Mm -hmm. And uh uh so you know here here's this first one and we've got so much more that uh we'll bring it to you in episode thirty eight. Uh, when we can get that one together, yeah. um, which will probably be a week before the 2018 NAB. That, or what I'm hoping to do is that I hope to put out the uh, NAB 2017 episode two or uh, uh, version two uh, or part two uh, right after the Cinegear, and we'll have to record <laughs> all that. And maybe we'll, maybe you won't know the difference, ladies and gentlemen. Maybe we'll just call it Cinegear, and we don't have to send <laughs> Keith anywhere. You know. Yeah, it's this. Yeah, the 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 Paramount Studios will be dressed up <laughs> to look like the LA. I mean, the Las Vegas con Convention Center. Any reference we make to NAB, we'll just do those <laughs> audio drop cuts and just go Cinegear. Yeah, or we could just blame it on the bad uh, wireless transmitter. <laughs> like, <laughs> right, that like RF. <laughs> Hello, does this microphone work? Hello. But uh, anyway, I'm not muchachos. <laughs> <laughs> that is that that's a big highlight. All right. So uh so we are going to bring you more of NAB 2017 in the next episode. Uh but we just wanted to share with you what we had thus far yes. and we'll get it together for the next one, okay? Yep. Uh but uh in the meantime, uh let us take care of some of our housekeeping stuff because oh, yeah. you know well, I, and this is the time and I just want to remind you folks who don't want to listen to this. Just turn it off now. But, um, you know, because you're going to skip over it anyway. <laughs> but for the people that are really interested in supporting Tech Move, this is what you want to listen to. So go on, Rod. That's right. And uh, th th this is where, you know, hey, you know, this is our advertising right here that, that we're, that we're going to ask you to participate in. Uh, because you can help out. Uh, not only putting this show, continuing on with this show for free and making it available to all the great listeners out there, but it also supports uh, Keith's uh, uh, show habit, uh, going to NAB and Cinegear and all these great things. <laughs> but in reality, what it does is that it really does pay for us to keep Tech Move out there for everyone to listen to. And what we want to do is that we want to ask you guys to help support us. And one of our favorite ways to do that is uh, doing your shopping on Amazon mm -hmm. and clicking uh, your way to help us out. Keith, can you explain that for us, please? Yep. Just go to uh, just type in your URL. You just just type in your URL. URL, you mean <laughs> the, the URL? URL? The, the URL. URL. The URL. Yeah. Just type in the little link bar space at the top of your browser. Um, <laughs> The Ural, <laughs> the Ural, the Ural Mountains. Um, type type in now, no, but now now you people have really tuned out and fast forwarded to the next episode. But uh, techmovepodcast dot com slash Amazon. Just just use that link. It'll get you to Amazon. It'll put a little cookie in there for, for you to 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 give us a commission on whatever you buy. So buy something big. 
there's some pretty expensive stuff there, so you, you'll you'll help us out. Like a GH5. Even more expensive. You could right. get even more expensive stuff. Maybe okay. two GH5s. Two GH5s are <laughs> like that. fantastic. Good. Yeah. And batteries. That, that's not a great th- way to do it. Yes. Not the third-party batteries. The real Panasonic batteries. Real Panasonic batteries. <laughs> uh, so that's a great way to support us. We also mm-hmm. ask you to subscribe to us on iTunes. Just search mm-hmm. for Tech Move. We also have a Facebook presence. We're at uh, Tech Move Podcast. We have a. Uh, you can reach us on Twitter. Twitter are, uh, is is at Tech Move Podcast, all one word. And uh, there are a couple new ways now that you can listen to us. Uh, if it's not through iTunes, we've got a couple ways. You can reach us on Stitcher, which is a cool play, which is a cool thing. Uh, and you can also listen to us on Player FM. Both of those avenues, we ask you to search for us under Tech Move. And uh, we actually have a new way of supporting us. Uh, Keith, why don't you go ahead and explain this neat little thing? Yeah, so um, there's been a lot of buzz about this new site called Patreon. And I think it came out maybe a year or two ago. But um, it seems like a lot of podcasters and a lot of well, creative people um, are kind of using it for um, supporters to, to give to give us money, basically. Um, so, it, 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 it's pretty easy. You just go to patreon.com and you can search for Tech Move or Tech Move Podcast, or you can just type in the URL, uh, patreon.com slash techmovepodcast, and our page will come up. And if you want to become a pat- Patreon, uh, patron of our podcast, there's a little button that says become a patron. And patrons are, are traditionally people that that uh, give money to artists, you uh, support the arts, and I guess we're artists, right, Rod? I and like to call myself one. Yeah. You know. So yeah, we are. We're artists. Yeah. So uh, you can click on become a patron, and you can actually donate. I think it's from one dollar to an infinite amount of dollars per month, and it'll once you sign up, it'll be deducted from whatever payment method you've you've set up. And if you want to, you know, a dollar a month, if if, if Millions of people do it. That'll help us a lot. That would help us a great yeah. deal, especially yeah. with doing all these like two plus hour <laughs> episodes that we often do. So yeah, so um, yeah, so if you want to show your support, just go to that link. It's also on our website, and uh, check it out. Hey, you know what? Speaking about that, I don't think I mm-hmm. gave him the website. The website is www.techmovepodcast.com. You can reach us there and uh, see where all these ways to support the podcast is. And we would greatly appreciate it. It helps out a lot. Little bit goes a long way. So we greatly appreciate all of you who support us. And thank you so much for uh, listening and uh, giving us your time and effort. So Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. much appreciated. Thank you so much, Keith. We're going to wrap this one up, and we're going to come back and do another episode of uh, NAB 2017, duh, <laughs> and uh, and continue on with all those other great uh, interviews and highlights that we have. So let's wrap it up for here, uh, for right now. I have been Rod Louie. Keith, thank you so much for doing all the heavy lifting. I appreciate it. <laughs> My pleasure. Excellent. We will see you next time on another fantastic episode of Tech Move.